Oh, I'm live. Hey, everyone. I'm here. Wow. Okay. So this is my first time doing this. And um, I got a ton of questions, like over 100 questions. Well, before I start all that, um, let me just say hi to everyone, because um, the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to be reading my questions and I'm not really going to be able to watch the stream. And I know the stream is half of the whole thing of going live. Um, I don't. Hey, Miss Yvette, good morning. I think I have a question from you on here. Lucretia, Peter M, uh, Jana. Um, I love it. I wish I could like monitor the stream and respond to you, but I don't have a producer. I'm just here by myself. So, and my dog Barney can't do it. He's lying on the floor at, at my feet. Um, so I'm going to be reading your questions and answering them. Um, I'm going to go as long as I can. The limiting factor here is probably me needing to go to the ladies room. Uh, hopefully that I can last a few hours if you all will hang around that long. So a few logistics before we get started. Um, here are the questions, actually. I cut and pasted them. Over 100 questions, 100 and something. And there are some even from the, um, so I took questions from my community tab, but also my email list, Facebook, um, Instagram, and there's still questions that I didn't get to. And I really am sorry about that. I just had to cut it off at some point. Um, I have like a top 75 here that I hope I can get to um, in this live stream. Um, that's pretty ambitious, I know, but I'm going to try and power through them as long as you're interested. And then I do have an index. I've like indexed them because what I plan to do, if you can see this, um, is have timestamps for the questions so that in the replay that you can just go back and see, hmm, oh yeah, I want to know about that and go to that question. So that's how I plan to do this. Um, it is now 10 o'clock. We don't have to start exactly 10 o'clock, but, um, but I might as well get started because I got a lot to cover. So thank you all for showing up. I really love seeing you here. And this is me unplugged. You'll probably notice there's a big difference between me unplugged and me recorded. All right. So let me get my questions up. And so when I do this, I can't see the stream, but okay. All righty. Oh, okay. Actually, a couple other logistical things. So um, another thing, out of the 100 plus questions that I got, there were probably only about six or seven that have to do with our current situation with this, this global crisis that we're in. And I think those questions, which actually I was surprised by that, that means you all have a lot more, a lot of other things you wanna know about, but I do think that topic deserves its own video. So I, I, I took those questions out and I will be covering um, that whole issue in a whole nother video. I may do another live, so I would like to know from you in the comments if you like this format, um, or I could pre-record it and just do questions, answers, pre-recorded. We'll see how that goes. All right, so enough of me babbling on. I think those are the only logistics, but yes, there will be a replay of this. All right, so let's go. Let me pull up my questions. The first one is from Pillowbug. I'm so excited for this chat. Can we touch on, oops, wait, this is not the right, see, see how it is? When you go live, you can't edit things out. Um, that actually was pillow bug. That question has to do with the current um, crisis. And that was one that I cut out. So um, I'm going to go on to the next one, but I will cover that in a different one. All right. So this is really question number one from Julia. Why are neurodevelopmental disorders like Tourette syndrome in the DSM-5? Tourette syndrome seems to be more of a biological sickness like type 1 diabetes and less a mental disorder like bipolar. Same with TBI, which is traumatic brain injury, patients that are in the psych ward. 
The behaviors and treatments look the same as a mental disorder, but it stems from a different place. Do you think these disorders should be in the DSM? I love that question because it 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 um, touches on this whole issue. I'm gonna make sure my mic is up. Touches on this issue of whether mental disorders are brain disorders or is it just behavioral and you know just get your act together kind of thing. And that might not exactly be what you meant by that, Julia, but I have a video on my site, on, on, on my channel called, um, I forget the actual title, but it has to do with, um, oh, wow, I see a blue. Thanks, S. Will, for the super chat. I don't even know how super chat works, actually. But um, thank you so much for the um, $1.50 super chat and the rose. I love it. Thank you. Um, mental, we, we know from looking at brain scans, functional imaging, so Functional imaging is where you look at the activity of the brain. Instead of just taking a still picture like you would get with an MRI or a CT scan, you actually see how the brain is um, utilizing glucose. That's how it's measured, but how the brain is functioning while you're thinking, talking, and things like that. So we know that the brains of people who are depressed, have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia even, the brains look different. And brains look different when someone is depressed. So it is a brain disorder um, that is similar to um, pancre—I uh, was going to say pancreatitis, similar to diabetes, where you have um, malfunctioning, um, you have a malfunctioning pancreas. So the brain is an organ, just like the other organs in your body. And if it does, even though it does control like your body movements, but it also controls your emotions and the way you perceive things and your thinking. So if any part of the brain is malfunctioning, it, it's going to affect that area. And if it happens to be the area of your perception, like whether you know something is real or not real or your behavior, your emotions, then that's what's going to be affected. So I do think um, mental disorders belong in the DSM, just like Tourette's or sorry, your question was, does something like Tourette's belong in the DSM? Um, I do believe um, Tourette's belongs in the DSM because there's a lot of comorbid or a lot of problems that can occur with it. So sometimes people can have um, Tourette's syndrome and it go along with bipolar disorder, depression, but it can also cause a lot of problems like anxiety just because the behavior can be um, so dramatic. It tends to be covered or treated by neurologists though but it, it, it's one of those like co-occurring psychiatric and um, mental disorders. All right, next one. I hope that answers your question, Julie. I didn't want to ramble too long on that. Number three is um, how do I be less seen? How do I be seen as less vulnerable? So this is a touch broad because what do you mean by vulnerable? And this question is by glow. Vulnerable could be fragile. It could be appearing not very assertive. Um, it could be that you are easily pulled into something, so gullible. Um, I would say if it has to do with things like being gullible or easily tricked or easily talked into something or not having a will of your own, then the way to address that is to improve your assertiveness, your ability to assert your opinions and your thoughts with people. And that takes practice and it's a process. Um, so, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Shelly, thank you so much. $20 super chat and a little dancing thing. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Is that real? Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. I got it. Is that real? A hundred dollar super chat from Vasu. Wow. Thank you, Vasu. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> Um, all right. Don't make me unstable here. I'm trying to get through these questions. Thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate you. Okay. Number four, or actually number three here. I'm going to say number four just because that's how I have them numbered, given that I skipped question number one um, from Sanjeev. Today's question would be, what is normal? If we distinguish it from understanding abnormal behavior according to the DSM, so this is one of those questions that's kind of more, I guess, theor 
it's um, left to someone's perception or someone's judgment. I mean, what is normal? What's normal to you? What's normal to me? In general, though, we think about it as um, abnormal behavior would be behaviors that create problems of some sort. So, uh, and people with abnormal behavior usually have some level of distress or it causes problems to some degree. So let's say I have a strong personality, which some people probably say that I do, but let's say I have a strong personality and I, I, um, just kind of blow over people when I'm talking. I don't let people's opinions, I don't listen to people's opinions, um, which that's not true about me, but this is just an example. Is that normal? Well, okay, it might be functional for me in some settings. I may find a spouse who deals with that because it's probably some, it would have to be someone who's a little more passive and doesn't mind me just taking the lead. Um, but it does it create problems for me? It might if I, I could have multiple jobs that I lose because I can't get along with people. Um, I may. So it's hard to I, I don't want to go too long in this, but it's hard to, um, you know, normal is really relative in, in a sense, especially when it comes to behaviors and personalities. But there is a line that we draw between what we call maladaptive behaviors, behaviors that cause problems for people um, and, and cause internal distress. So they can cause problems because of the way you relate to people. And then they can cause distress internally because it makes you anxious or you feel depressed. Is depressed normal? Well, no, it's not normal to not want to live or not want to get out of the bed and get going every day. So that's my take on, on abnormal versus normal. Abnormal would be something that is not adaptive, that does not promote relationships, does not promote a sense of well-being. Okay, number five from Drama Fan. Can you offer any tips on how to vet a therapist for professionalism and ability to meet your needs, especially remotely? And how do you set goals gauge progress and determine when to move on from attending therapy itself or seeing a particular provider? Can you note red flags to be aware of, including boundary violations, self-disclosures on the part of the provider? Okay, so unfortunately, um, vetting a therapist can take, take a lot out of you because a lot of it ha can have to do with just general fit. Um, you can, and, and I think nowadays people have, um, more people have websites. Back when I started my website or got developed a website, it was like 2007. There weren't a lot of therapists, psychiatrists, and clinicians online, at least not in my area. Now there's more people online, so it's a little easier to get a sense of what is, what kind of vibe do you get from them? So one part of vetting is vibe. Um, some people will allow you to do like a, um, a, a 15 minute discovery session. Um, I don't do that just because I just don't have the time to do that. But I feel like I have enough information about me online for someone to get a sense of whether they like just the way I act. Um, so that's one thing, vibe and fit. So you may not fit well, you may not just like the way that the person delivers their treatment, and that's okay. But yes, unfortunately, it means having to try on a lot of shoes, so to speak. As far as red flags and things, so hold on. Um, I was trained very conservatively that you do not disclose a lot about yourself from uh, uh, in the therapy, because what you're trying to achieve is as much of a blank slate as possible so that the, the patient can um, project their own stuff onto you. And that could be a part of the treatment. Also, you don't, you, you want to allow enough room for the person in therapy to address their own issues and not have it kind of deteriorate into well, oh yeah, that happened to me too. My husband, blah, blah, blah. And now it, you're just having like a coffee chat about each other's lives. And um, that's not that useful as far as a therapeutic um, process. So um, some people are more strict about that. 
some people less strict. Some people are more willing to disclose uh, things. I've gotten over the years, I've gotten a little looser with that. If someone asks me, um, so do you have children? Back in the day when I first came out of training, I might have said, I was trained to say, so why do you ask that? How does that make you feel? But I think that's artificial and weird. So um, even though that's how I was trained. So I'll answer the question, but I'm, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail because then it can kind of lead to that. So as far as boundary violations, um, it's, it, you know, you don't, red flags would be someone maybe wanting to chat it up too much about themselves. Um, if they spend more time giving examples of their own life, then how much time are you spending delving into yours? And um, certainly you shouldn't be having relationships with patients outside of, outside of the treatment. That can be harder if someone's in a small town where they don't know anybody else. I mean, pay all the patients in town are people they know personally. So it can get a little tricky that way. But um, I would say, uh, so that's my opinion about that. All right. Sorry to cut that off. I could, I could probably do a video on just about all of these questions, but I don't want to do that this morning. Okay. Question number six from Poppy. What's the best job and career choice for a person with bipolar and BP, I'm assuming that's borderline personality, and ADHD, who is an ambivert? First choice was nursing, but I have been told to dream on, could it work, and do you have other suggestions? Okay, so ambivert, I actually had to look that up because I hadn't heard that term before, but that's just someone who's neither um, an intro or a, a mix between being an introvert and an extrovert. So extrovert is someone who derives their, um, uh, it, it's energizing to be around people and they need that kind of uh, constant or not constant necessarily, but they need that interaction with people. And introvert generates their energy from um, solitude and having time in their own head. Um, so an ambivert would be someone who's in the middle. They kind of need a little of both. As far as having bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder, I would not, I think it's a bit much to say dream on. I have colleagues who have both of these. I mean, that, that these don't prevent you from, I don't think these should prevent you from doing any kind of job. The exception to that would be if it's a kind of job that is going to directly impact your ability directly impact your, your health like. So with bipolar disorder, um, how much you sleep and things is really important. And not sleeping enough can ramp you up toward having mania. So, it, so night shift work may be really hard on you that way. But not all nurses work the night shift. So even that, I don't see how that keeps you from being able to do that kind of job. Um, so I don't see any of these, any of these issues that you mentioned, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, or ADHD being something that, that puts you in a, in a category where you need to dream on and only think about certain, um, certain types of work. It's just a matter of, can you handle the demands of that work and being able to, to be able to take care of yourself? Um, you know, another job that may not work out well for that kind of for, for problems where self-care is really important is something like um, I think I had someone who's a, a fire uh, fireman and they would work like 72 hours at a time and then off. So doing that, being on all the time like that, that's not good for anyone's health. But especially if you're vulnerable mentally, that's probably not a good option for you. OK, OK. The glam number seven, the glam bite. What kind of therapy would you recommend for someone wanting healthy relationships, but can't seem to get over the fear of showing their true selves at times? I'm bipolar and have ADHD. I come from an abusive childhood, but I really want to thrive and not be continuously feel like I'm not capable enough to do that. All right. So the way I summarize that question, because I have these little snippets that I wrote was, What's the best therapy to help with relationships if you're a guarded person? That's what not wanting to show your true self is. That's what we would call it clinically is person's guarded. Um, 
there's not a specific therapy that, that you need because you're guarded. You just need a therapist who's going to recognize that and help pull you out of that. And that's what therapists do. It's not like that's a needle in a haystack kind of therapist. That's what we learn about in doing therapy with people. So you should be able to trust that a professional is going to recognize that, that you have this problem and help bring you out of that. Um, as far as having a health relationship, but yet having a traumatic um, past, there's lots of trauma therapies. And I think trauma therapy is better than um, just kind of explore We call it exploratory psychotherapy of just kind of, you know, what's going on today kind of thing. Um, tell me, tell me how you did with this and that and the other, how are things going with you? What, what do you think about this? And, and, you know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm poo-pooing therapy. I do therapy and those are some of the questions I ask, but, uh, therapy, but, but a trauma therapy has more of a specific purpose in mind and there's specific modalities. So there's EMDR, which is eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. There's uh, cognitive processing therapy. There's uh, somatic therapy. There's a lot of different kinds of therapies um, for trauma that I don't do. And th because they, they require certain um, training that a lot of people do. So uh, a lot of the people in my area that do that tend to be master's level therapists and they will specialize in trauma based therapies. There's also, I mean, psychologists will do it too. So what you need to look for is someone who has um, a lot of experience with or specializes in trauma-based therapy. And then that can also help you with your relationships. Okay, sip of water. I've got this mic. When I have dry mouth, I get these like dry mouth sounds that I can't stand. I, I, so don't listen with earbuds. I'm gonna try and edit that out, but I'm not sure if I'll be successful. Okay, next, number nine, moving on down the list from Chris. Can you talk about adult ADHD, high functioning ADHD, and how people can go about being tested and considered medical treatments such as Ritalin or Adderall? Is this a process a GP can begin or uh, would you recommend one going straight to a psychiatrist? I personally suspect I have high functioning ADHD and would like to seek treatment. I pulled good grades in college and do well at my work, but it has always been very difficult to, for me to concentrate. My mind easily wanders throughout the day and it's very difficult for me to focus on the task at hand. This makes it hard for me to get tasks started and remain focused to finish the work in a timely manner. I had high grades in high school and do well at my work, but feel it takes me much more time to complete tasks as often as I cannot focus and stay engaged despite removing distractions. As an adult, I have more control over this, but overall I, I suspect this is something I should have had evaluated and might have benefited from treatment as a child. Okay. Um, I think I saw a super chat go through and I really apologize for missing that. Um, Lewis, thank you so much for the super chat, the three for the, the, oh, and that's in pounds. I'm not sure how much that is in, uh, dollars, 350. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. When I'm done, I'm going to go through the, the chat. I hope there's a way I can like thank people, but I'm not sure. All right. So. Chris's question is essentially, how do you get tested for ADHD? Should it, can, can your general practitioner do this? Like, how do you get started with treatment if you're an adult already? So um, there, there are tests for ADHD. The, really, the diagnosis is based on symptoms, symptom presentation, and history. So it's talking. I have done some testing before. There's this one called the Connors test where the person looks at things on a screen and they're like, it's like these dots and they have to like press, 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 press. And so if you can't, and that tests your attention and focus, et cetera. And I've had some people who are telling me, I cannot get my work done. I'm about to lose my job, but they did fine on the Connors. So what does that mean? Does that mean, well, no, you don't have ADHD. So go lose your job. I wasn't going to do that. So I stopped doing um, objective testing. 
it's probably more important in some setting where you're trying to prove something or get some accommodations. But even then, I've written letters without that. So all that to say, as an as a child, it's probably ADHD could be picked up on, diagnosed by, and treated by pediatricians, and that's where a lot of people will start. They will give the pediatricians will usually give. Um, um, these like questionnaires to give to the teachers to complete and stuff like that. And if they check enough boxes, oh, okay, yep, sounds like you got ADHD, all right, and they'll get medication from the pediatrician. An adult, probably an internist or family doctor is not gonna start it on, start medicine on you as an adult. Um, there are still people who feel like adult ADHD isn't something that's legitimate. Um, and unfortunately, that's perpetuated by people who are using it for performance enhancement. So they've done well all their lives. Now they've got this super high power job they want to keep up. They're only sleeping you know, a couple hours a night. But hey, they still need to do this. So they go get stimulants because they can't focus and they can't focus because they're working too hard and burning themselves out and not sleeping. But stimulants can make anybody move faster, think faster. It's not evidence, though, of ADHD as a brain disorder that started in childhood. So all that to say, you probably will need to go see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist should just talk to you. Some people will use forms that you complete kind of self, um, we call them um, self, I'm blanking on the term, but these, these forms that you'll fill out asking, you know, do you do this? Do you have problems with this? You have problems with this to help them just kind of generate more of the symptoms that you have. And then um, if, it, if it's causing enough problems for you, start medication. So it's not something you've got to prove a lot of the time. If you have enough of the problems, um, you could start a trial. Let's see, you did mention, uh, so yeah, Ritalin and Adderall. Ritalin is a methylphenidate product. Adderall is an amphetamine product. And I will say though, you didn't ask this specifically, but the methylphenidate products like Ritalin tend to work better in children and the amphetamine products tend to work better in adults. Okay. Could you have benefited as a child? Probably, but just because you didn't get treatment as a child doesn't mean it's over. It just means that you may have missed some things being easier for you than they, than they otherwise were. All right. Number 11 from So Naya. Um, how to overcome self-sabotage, especially when you may not understand why you're getting in your own way. So Naya, let me sip, get a sip of water for that one. This is something that really would take some self-discovery, um, some digging out of what kind of sabotage are you talking about? Are you, so if you were, if you came to my office for this, I would, and you just said, how do I overcome self-sabotage? I would say, okay, well, give me some examples. How are you, what are you calling sabotage? Is it, because people can do this in different ways. They can um, uh, ruin relationships. Some, they finally get a good partner and they just find a way to scare that person away. That might have to do with fears of being close to someone, even though you really want to be close, but you're afraid of them knowing something about you. You have some insecurities. Um, it, you could it could be in more manifest in the work set work setting. Like maybe you um, tend to mess up jobs. Here you finally got a good one, and here you go again. You're fighting with the boss, and um, oh, thank you so much for the five dollar super chat from I can't see the name. Um, but thank you very much for that. Um, it, it, it could show up in the workplace where you, you fight with people or you just do a bad job of your, of your work. Um, you, don't, you, you know you have deadlines to meet and you just don't do them. Now, on that note, maybe you don't meet your deadlines because you've got some other issues going on like ADHD, for example. And I'm, I don't want you to um, take that to mean that if you don't do well in your work, you've got ADHD. Okay, it's not that cut and dry, but, and disclaimer that I forgot to say at the beginning of this, none of this is personal medical advice for me to you. You need to see your own therapist, doctor for actual diagnosis. Okay, thank you. So back to your question, um, 
so self-sabotage getting at why first you need to get at the root of as far as getting at the root of why you self-sabotage it depends on the setting in which you do it and then a a therapist or maybe even a friend if you don't have a therapist really you know a therapist is this is part of what therapists do to help dig out and pull things out that you can't see yourself it, short of that, maybe a friend, a very close friend, a confidant could ask you some prompting questions like I just did of thinking about what are the settings that you do this. And then when you look at that setting, kind of um, reverse engineer what happened with that. And maybe that could give you some insight into why you're doing that. What is your fear and how you can get past that fear? All right. Hope that was helpful. Number 12, Glenn. I have a question when my question is when bipolar mania comes with paranoid delusions, is it always considered bipolar one? I think you said that in a prior video, just wanted to make sure. And that answer is yes. So there's not always, always a clear crystal clear line between mania and hypomania. It's, it's more of a threshold issue and a degree of dysfunction that it causes. But if someone has psychosis, it's mania. That kind of, that's a, a for sure. Short, if you don't have psychosis, then it's kind of, you know, how much, how severe, how ramped up are you and how much trouble is it causing you? So uh, psychosis would be delusions. It could be um, hearing voices. So, uh, you know, and another thing, my voice is, I can't let my voice give out. I don't know about you guys, but here we've got like an inch thick of pollen. And I actually woke up like four o'clock this morning with all these. What if I what if I start coughing? What if you know, what if our, our electricity goes out and my Internet goes down? OK, so I do those things, too. But I'm here. So with um, the I was saying something. So I got off track. See, this is why, you know, live is different from editing. Uh, I got off track on the, oh, so another thing I was going to point out about um, delusional thinking with mania. So we call these ideas of reference and they're kind of like quasi delusional. Um, you know, arguably they may or not be all the way delusional. Delusional would be a fixed false belief. So you believe it to be true despite the evidence or evidence around you that it is not, but you know that it is. So these ideas of reference can be you feel like um, you're getting special messages from the television or the radio. So someone will say, um, you know, all these things are coming together because so-and-so said that, you know, there's love. And I know that that means that, um, that I'm not loving myself and I need to love the world and I need to go out and do blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to move to Australia and blah, blah, blah. And it just like, they have this whole thing that's built around this message about love, which, you know, anybody can say the word love. So they, but they've taken that to mean the special thing to them. That's ideas of reference. So that's another way your thoughts can change during mania. Okay. 13 Heather. When a person with bipolar disorder has an extreme manic episode, is the change in their behavior considered a different personality, such as with dissociative identity disorder? No. Extreme mania is just extreme mania. It's not, it doesn't change your personality. Sometimes people can walk away from a manic episode feeling as though that wasn't them. Like that wasn't me. That was this other person. And I talk about that actually in a video that I did on bipolar disorder and the imposter syndrome. I think that's the full title, but if you just kind of scroll down, it's also in my bipolar playlist, you could find it there, but it's kind of old. So it may not kind of come up on my first page, but people can, if there's, so that video was based on someone else's question about feeling as though they faked their illness during their illness, because after it's all over, they're like, this is so different from who I am that I must have just been faking that I must have been lying about that because 
I can't imagine who, who does this? Who goes and buys another car when they just bought one the day before? Who does that? No one. So that just wasn't me. So that's the answer to that. It's not a different personality. It's just that the, it's just that the, the state can take you in a direction that makes you do things that you otherwise wouldn't. I call it going into the stratosphere when I'm talking to patients and they're like starting to ramp up or afraid they're going to, I was like, you know, we don't want to add this medicine because it may take you to the stratosphere. Okay. Number 14, Marlene. Hi, Dr. Tracy. I have a question about my sister. What are ways as a family member, I can guide my sister to seek help. I have a strong belief she's battling schizophrenia and is in complete denial. I either come off too strong or avoid any interaction with her. Yeah, this is really hard. And I've gotten a number of questions um, in the comments in various videos or even in an email of how do I talk to this family member? And there's not really one approach to that. It's 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 it just depends on the situation. I will say it is very hard. It is very hard to get someone who doesn't have the insight that they have a problem enough to see to seek treatment. And especially when it involves psychosis, because at that point, the person does not believe that whatever they're thinking or doing, that there's anything wrong with that. It just feels normal to them. So if they feel like everyone is being inhabited by aliens and people believe this stuff. I'm not just, I mean, I'm making it up, but I'm making it up based on things I've heard. Um, that is their truth and they're not, and, and, and so they may be behaving in a way of hiding things and, you know, talking about this conspiracy, or they may stop talking because they realize you're not buying any of it or you're not listening. So they stop talking about it, but you see behaviors or evidence that they're, they're doing stuff based on these thoughts. Um, you're not going to be able to say, you need to see a doctor. They're going to be like, you need to see a doctor because you, you're not preparing for what's coming. Now, where I try, when someone does drag someone in by the scruff of their neck, where I try, it's still hard to treat that person because they're like, I'm only here because he made me come, but I don't want to talk to you, but go ahead and ask me questions. I mean, I've, I've had people talk that way to me. And so where, where I try and meet them is, well, you tell me what are some of the things that are causing you problems. And I try and meet them at a pain point. So you could act similarly. Is there something that your sister's doing that's causing, that's a pain point for her? So let's say she's um, hearing voices or there's something going on that she feel, you know, she feels haunted in some way by, by um, her delusions or, or hearing voices or something. And it's causing a lot of anxiety because anxiety is something that some people with psychosis will say that they experience, but it may not be an anxiety disorder. It just means maybe that they're overcome by their psychotic symptoms. So if she's anxious or she's not sleeping, forget about the fact that she believes about the aliens. Just forget that. Go in the area of, you know, if you sleep better, I think you could feel a lot better let's go to the doctor. I'll go with you. I think you could really get help. I know so-and-so who's gotten help or check out this doctor. You might want to show her one of my videos. I don't know, but something where the, you're, you're focused on her pain point, whatever it is to get her into treatment. That's what I would say. I wouldn't try and challenge her on you have serious problems and you need to get help for them because if she doesn't agree with you, then it's just going to turn into a fight. And then you're really not going to. And so at some point, you just got to let go and let her realize on her own that she's failing and falling and stumbling and get the help, get some form of help at that point. So just wait for her to fall into your arms asking for help and then take her. Okay, where am I? Number 15, Noah. How to go along the process of therapy, or at least gain emotional intelligence on my own since I can't get therapy at the moment? What are some of the key questions to ask myself? Or if you have any exercise or tips for general mental health? Okay, so my snippet summary of this 
question was, how to gain emotional intelligence on your own with self-discovery questions. Uh, Noah, I did a video on, uh, what video was that I did? Ooh. On um, emotional, where I talk about emotional intelligence. I thought, I think I just did that video. Uh, look back on, I'm not gonna search for it now, but um, yes, I, thank you, thank you. Who am I thinking? I'm thinking myself. I did a video on um, on how not to be an emotional sponge. And that was just last week. And I talk about the way to do that. An emotional sponge is the person who just absorbs other people's emotions because you kind of don't take a stand internally on what you feel about things. So you just, other people can just push their stuff onto you and you take ownership of it. And in that video, I talk about one of the ways around that is through um, improving your own emotional intelligence, which is the ability to appreciate, know and appreciate how you feel about something and be assertive and assert your thoughts and feelings um, in situations where others are around and you be able to say, this is how I feel. But you to do that, you've got to be able to recognize how you feel in a given situation. And I even have these emotional uh, emotions cards that have that helps you put a name to a feeling that you have. What are self-discovery questions? That I can't really answer easily without knowing more about you. Um, that would take a little bit more thought to see, well, what circumstances are you talking about? In, in yeah, what circumstances are you talking about? Um, so without that, I, I can't give you self-discovery questions, sorry. All right, Amber. My mental health question is, is ADD aggravated by mental illness such as depression and bipolar disorder? Yes, it is. And ADD can also, it can work both ways, aggravate depression and bipolar disorder. So um, there's a lot that can affect your ability to focus and concentrate. And depression can do that. Anxiety can do that. Um, mania or hypomania can do that. And then and those would be non ADHD reasons for attention problems. And then ADHD is its own thing that has its own um, places in the brain where there are deficits, um, like the prefrontal cortex. As an example, I actually have a video, an upcoming video, I'm not sure when it is, it's either maybe in a couple weeks, or maybe next week, I'm not sure, talking about executive dysfunction. And I think you may find that very interesting. Um, but executive dysfunction is one of the big things that is a problem with ADHD. So it's not just um, focus and concentration, it's planning, it's ability to um, anticipate outcomes and things like that. So um, stay tuned for that. But if you have depression or bipolar disorder, see, I, I, I didn't even drink. I'm so like focused on answering your question. Hold on. If you have depression or bipolar disorder, which means depression or, or mania or hypomania, those conditions can certainly worsen all of those problems that you can have with your ADHD. Um, and so what do you do about that? It gets tricky. It gets tricky trying to treat both ADHD and um, bipolar, bipolar disorder, namely mania, because the stimulants can worsen mania. The stimulants um, can actually improve depression. Uh, there are some people who are so slowed with their depression that sometimes adding a stimulant can be helpful that way. Hold on a second. Well, my little um, grooming things here that I can't like take off camera, but, um, some people can be so severely depressed that they can't, they can't even like move. And so stimulants can actually help them. But if you have bipolar disorder where you have both depression and mania, sometimes the, um, the stimulants can send you into the stratosphere. Like I mentioned, and can make that worse or make you cycle more, go in between bipolar and, uh, sorry, go in between mania and depression. So 
I do have some patients with bipolar disorder who still take stimulants, um, not a lot. And I have had the ones where tried to add a stimulant, I think, and, and it wasn't good. Um, I very, I'm very reluctant to do it in someone who has bipolar one where they've gotten psychotic and ended up in the hospital because I see that as just, I, if I add a stimulant, that might happen again. And the, and the hospital tends to be a very, very traumatic experience for people, even though it's, it's, it's there to, for treatment, the process of like being in a locked facility and, um, and especially if you were taken there against your will and all of that tends to be very upsetting. So it's not something you just want to do. Okay, let's, let's take this. And if I go to the hospital, oh, well, um, so, you know, it takes a little positive, negative risks, benefit analysis. Okay. Next, where am I? Number 17 from Ariel. A viewer from Kenya here. Hi from Kenya, Ariel. How can I overcome procrastination, imposter syndrome, and a smorgasbord of self-diagnosed because I am too broke to afford therapy neurosis? Uh, okay, so, and then Blue Squirrel chimed in and said, have you tried meditation or any other mindful practice? And Ariel, you said, I've tried, but I never... I've never get past the first session, so stop. So stop, start spasmodic experiences. I always end up forgetting even what I'm doing and lost in thought. That can happen with meditation, and it's actually okay. That's part of the process of getting yourself back. Thank you for the super chats. Um, I can't see who it is. I don't want to click on anything and have something stop. So thank you so much. I hope that I'm able to like send a thank you after the fact when I go back through the chat. All right. Um, so, and then Blue Squirrel said, okay, well, have you tried guided meditation? And Ariel said, I tried Headspace once mm -hmm, and impatience got the better of me. Okay, once. All right. So I just had to say that, but all right, here's the thing. I'll probably say this a bunch of times on this live stream. This is a process, like getting better and getting improvement is a process. And I, I realize meditation and things like that are not easy. Just like someone wants to lose weight, watch your diet. That's not easy. That's usually not what we want to hear. It's like, well, what else can I do to lose weight? Um, overcoming procrastination when you, so ideally having a therapist or someone Thank you so much, Lewis, for the 350 super chat. Thank you. Um, having a therapist help or even a coach help you come up with a game plan or some tips to help you with the procrastination, that is the ideal. Okay. So let's take off that. You, you, can't, you can't afford the ideal. So what do you do instead? Um, I do think you need to give... So meditation, I'm not sure how helpful that may be for you for procrastination. Usually um, meditation can help certainly with anxiety, but also getting you centered, getting you kind of, I mean, I could, I guess it could help get you on this track of, okay, let me start my day with this, this frame of mind and just kind of help you have start from a calm, calmer place. But as far as the, like, I can't get going thing, um, I'm not sure how you would do that without some help and just on your own. There are, you could probably look on Amazon for some self-help books talking you through how to overcome procrastination, um, but you'd have to have the patience to actually read it all and do exercises. And, you know, I, I hesitate like this because so cognitive behavior therapy um, is a very good therapy and there are some self-help versions of it. I don't do a lot of it because I tend to, I, I guess I tend to have a, a, a group of people who that's not really what they want to do. They don't want to do worksheets and homeworks and 
it's just not for everyone. So if you have trouble like getting through a meditation, you may have trouble getting through worksheets and self-discovery questions and answering things and so on and so forth. But maybe not. Maybe that kind of activity it'll be easier for you. And if that's the case, I would say you can try some self-help books on Amazon related to procrastination. I don't have one off the top of my head to suggest though. All right. And one more thing about guided um, meditation though, guided meditation tends to be easier for the person who has the mind wandering problem because it's not requiring you to just clear your mind. It, it, all you have to do is listen to someone and do what they say. When your mind wanders, which everyone's does to some degree, the better you get at meditation, the less, but still it's a, it's a normal process for your mind to wander. Like, okay, I got to do this later and this later. You, you recognize that that's what you're doing and it's okay. You accept that and you bring yourself back to where you were. And eventually you just keep doing it. And eventually you'll get to where your mind wanders less and less. That's my thought about that. Okay, next, Anika and Kita, sorry. My current scenario is that I've been on so-called normal mood and it's been a year since I've had my depressive episode. I've had one manic episode two years back. Currently, I'm taking a very low dose of what looks like a lanzapine, I'm assuming that's what you mean, and some sleeping pills. Also, I maintain a very routine lifestyle should um, stopped alcohol and caffeine. My question is, should I finally accept myself as free? What you're asking here, you, you've been doing well. Are you done with this now? Like, is, are you, are you free of the illness or can it come back? And do you have to like accept a lifetime of medication? I actually have a video talking about this. Uh, can't remember the exact title, but it's something along the lines of, um, I'm talking about, will you always have um, a psychiatric diagnosis or, can, oh, I know it's something like, can you stop taking your medication? And um, it, it is the case that bipolar disorder, if that's really what you have, I think you said that you said depression, you didn't mention mania. Okay. Well, you know, you said bipolar disorder. I do think you have to accept that it's an illness that you have that doesn't go away. However, that doesn't have to mean that you are just going to be like, you know, stuck on some huge regimen of pills for the rest of your life and locked into this. Some episodes can come and go. I had a patient who came to see me and said that her, she had a manic episode every seven years. Now that's not the usual, we call that the inter-episode period, the time in between episodes. Some people can have inter-episode periods of weeks versus months, and some can have them be years. Um, probably the more common, at least in my experience, is probably more like several months in between episodes. But episodes don't have to be bottoming out depressed or in the stratosphere manic. They can be, so I'll tell people that they can expect like the, the, the ideal treatment if your mania, I miss my, um, I miss my visuals here, but if your mania is something where you go up and so you go manias up and depressions down and you go like this, kind of like a sine wave. The ideal is that if here's the top of the wave and here's the bottom that we bring that wave in. So now you just go like this instead of woo, woo, woo. And that's a more reasonable expectation. So what could this look like? Because if you try and go for a flat line of nothing, no up, no down, then you're flattened and you're over medicated and you don't like the way you feel. So that's not, that's not even a good place to try and get someone to, to like dump on so, med so much medicine that you feel nothing. That's not a good outcome. So I try and get people to where they still may get a little bit revved up and hey, life is, yeah, but they're still not doing anything destructive. And then maybe a little low, like, 
but they're still getting up, going to work. Um, they're still eating, they're, you know, they're, they're, still, they're still sleeping and not oversleeping and things. And so they just feel a little funky for a while. And then they come out of that. Now, do I want people to feel funky? No, but my point is, I'm just trying to get them from not feeling like way down here. Now you say that you feel normal back to normal. So you've gotten, instead of you going like this, you've, I guess you've gone up and then you've come down and now you're kind of back at baseline and you're hanging there for a while, which is great. And people can do that. They can be normal, but usually um, to maintain that is when people are staying on medication. So I've had, I have some patients who have been on maintenance medication and have not had an episode in years. Um, they still might feel a little up and a little low, but it's like nothing to pay much attention to and they're good with it. I think that's a reasonable expectation to shoot for that you might be a little up, a little down, but for the most part, you're still kind of moving forward and life is good. If you take the position, can I be free and stop this medicine? There are some people who can get off of medicine and still do all right, but you are kind of subject, subjecting yourself to going back to this. And there's this concept called the kindling effect um, where untreated episodes can make future episodes harder to treat and get under control. It's like the brain doesn't wanna be exposed to that kind of um, neurochemical imbalance for a long period of time. So then each time when you let, you know, jump on it, let's see, let's get some medicine in you to get rid of this. It takes harder to pull you out of it, whatever it is, whether it's mania or depression. So it's usually better to stay on medicine, but it doesn't have to be. So with bipolar disorder, what it took to get you well, isn't always what it takes to keep you well. So you might have an episode and your doctor need to, let's say it's mania and your doctor need to add a second mood stabilizer. And then when you come out of that, you can maybe pull, pull off the mood stabilizer, one of them and just keep you on one. Um, in my experience, Lamictal tends to be one of those that can be fairly easy to tolerate and take and, and almost forget that you're taking medicine. I mean, you got to put it in your mouth every day but not have this like, oh, I'm so medicated feeling. Not everyone, some people have side effects with Lamictal, gain weight and so on. But um, it is a little easier, gentler to take it, it, compared to some of the other mood stabilizers. So all I'm saying is to kind of wrap up this question is an, an Ankita, I keep wanting to say Anita, sorry. Um, I think the more you control lifestyle issues, um, and the more that you have a healthy nutrient dense diet, I have a video talking about the depression diet. I do think even though it was studied in depression, I do think it could be helpful, helpful for bipolar disorder as well, or any of the mood disorders, but, um, and exercise main getting good sleep, um, eight to eight to 10 hours or seven to nine hours is like ideal for adults. I know that's not always easy with bipolar disorder, especially in the hypomanic period, as long as you're getting at least six, all of those self care things can also keep the episode can help keep the episodes under control. Okay. 19 Luke, have you found a good dose for Mirapex? as an add-on treatment for resistant depression. So Mirapex, the generic name for that is Pramipexol, and it's used to treat restless legs and Parkinson's disease. It has been studied for um, depression, but uh, so far the studies haven't been all that positive, at least the ones that I've seen as showing, having enough evidence to show that it's helpful in treating depression, treatment resistant depression that is. The therapeutic dose range, I did look this up, was one to five milligrams used in some of the studies. So if someone is using that on you, um, you know, that's the, that's the dose range that is used in studies. But again, not a lot of evidence to support that it really does help with treatment resistant depression. Therefore, I haven't used it. 
Number 20, Saddam Hussein. Saddam um, actually is um, the reason for a video that I have coming up on bipolar spectrum. And I say it like that because he's gotten upset with me about not talking about bipolar spectrum and whatnot. So I said, okay, here. And I produced a video, but it's coming out April 22nd, Saddam. So I've said it on, I've said it publicly, so it will be coming. But anyway, I'm assuming you're a he says, why anxiety disorder is one of the most annoying disorder. Hold on, my mouth is getting dry. Why it makes a person's life hell, why it feels like a doomsday and like the angel of death is taking the soul out, so painful and miserable. What is the actual reason? We can come out of it on its own. Oh no, can we come out of it on its own? Okay, so I am a believer that um, anxiety is, is a lot more destructive and painful than people appreciate because it can, we, we can say, well, this made me anxious. I was a little anxious about doing this, this live stream. But that's not, my being anxious about doing this live stream is not an anxiety disorder. Oh, wow, thank you for the $20 super chat. All I see is a face and I can't like thank you by name. I'm, um, I really wish I could and I'm sorry, but thank you so much for that. Um, and I don't wanna click anything because I don't want something to go down. Um, but I really appreciate all of you and so thank you. All right, so back to Saddam's question. Um, so what I was saying is that with anxiety, um, I, 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 are, I don't know that I would call it the most dis annoying disorder because that's really up to an individual's opinion. I mean, I've had, um, and I did a video on which is worse, bipolar one versus bipolar two. And um, the, the, the gist of it was that with bipolar two, it, it, first of all, it's up to the individual to determine what's worse for them. But bipolar two, even though it's looked at as kind of a milder form of bipolar disorder, it's just that the mania, this is that you have hypomania instead of mania. That's where that mild issue comes from. But with bipolar two disorder, people tend to spend more time depressed than they do with bipolar one, where you have the classic mania and classic depression. People with bipolar two tend to can spend like years in a depression. And so that, you know, that person can say that's the most annoying. They don't want to live. Like, what's the point? All of it. I mean, they can, they can just feel like their life is miserable. Um, so I don't, I can't agree with you that um, anxiety is the most annoying disorder. I do think it's more annoying than people think that it is because you can have a lot of physical symptoms, heart rate, especially if you have panic attacks, heart racing, um, uh, I've had, I, you know, I had one person tell me they vomit every morning before they go to work. I mean, that's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. Like I wouldn't want to get up if I knew that here we go again. So, um, what's the actual reason? I don't know. I mean, again, I think it's, it's really subjective as to what's worse, but high cortisol levels and things that, that ramp up your uh, adrenaline fight or flight response and have give you trouble breathing and all of that, that can be really serious for, for people. And I think more serious than people appreciate. But thank you for the question, Saddam. Okay, question number 22 from Sapendia. And I'm sorry if I butcher people's names. I'm having a lot of paranoid thoughts that people are out to get me. There's a conspiracy against me. People have ulterior motives against me. Phone calls and, and posts coming through the door is a group of people trying to harm me, et cetera. What's this likely to be? I'm taking Seroquel. So Sapendia, um, I did a video talking about psychotic depression. And I talk about this common theme that some people can have or that I've seen a lot in people with psychotic depression where they will um, believe that there's this conspiracy of things going on. So I see this blue car outside my door every morning. That's that person that they're, they're looking into my house 
And then when I go to the grocery store, I see a red car coming toward me. That's also part of this group of people. You know, it, it can get, and you know, I'll say, oh, thank you for the super chat. Um, I'll say to people, that takes a lot of coordination for all those people to like know when you're going to the store and know when to pass you and then be in the store and see you when you're getting, when you're in the checkout line. They don't see it that way. They don't see that how unrealistic that is. They, they just know this is how it is. Okay. All that to say that, um, that sounds like you're delusional and why are you delusional? Well, you said you take Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic medication, but you know, delusions can come out of not only schizophrenia, and that's not that's not the only way reason, but depression, mania, drug use. There are certain drug. There's sometimes people can take uh, like cocaine. Um, certainly, the hallucinogens. Um, I wouldn't say alcohol unless you were just like stinking drunk. So an intoxicated state, maybe, but not so much alcohol. Um, so I would definitely say you need to see your doctor. If you don't have one, you need to get one because sometimes people can percolate with paranoid psychotic thoughts and just kind of go like that for a while and, and just not really do much harm to themselves or anyone else but sometimes it can ramp up and then you act on it in a way that's dangerous to you or someone else or very destructive without you realizing, okay, this is getting bad. So let me go see somebody now. It's like, you can't really control it that way. So it's best if you're having these kind of thoughts to see either a psych. Well, if you don't have access to a psychiatrist and start with any doctor. Okay. Why not a therapist? Because chances are you're going to need medication. We usually don't treat psychosis with therapy. So a ther you need someone who can prescribe something. Maybe adjust your... So whoever's prescribing your Seroquel, talk to that person. They, they need to adjust it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love these um, little stickers. Okay. No, another step. I've been going an hour. Wow. Love this. I'm only on question, uh, let's see, 22. I had the goal, my husband's taking a picture of me. I had the goal of um, getting through 75. I don't know if I will, but okay. Adnan, non. What are sustainable ways to overcome depression and anxiety, especially for people who just don't want to be on medication anymore? Therapy doesn't work for me at all. I did a few online CBT courses from psychologists that certainly helped a bit, but what are some other tips? Okay. Um, sustainable way. So sustainable means that you've got to sustain them and, and it takes discipline to sustain kind of going back to, I don't have the person's name in front of me, but um, the person who was saying, yeah, I tried meditation, but you know, you're probably going to have to do some things that are not easy and just take a lot of discipline. So some of the things that I kind of made notes for are, so for, for depression, things like the Mediterranean diet is a suggestion. And I did the, the um, that video on the depression diet. Take a look at that if you haven't already seen it, but it was a, it was, it's a modified Mediterranean diet. I'm not sure how they modified it, but it was studied. We knew that diet helps our mind. We've known that. Okay. That's not new. What's new about this is they actually did a trial or a study comparing people who had depression, didn't do the diet versus those who did and saw improvement. And that was very encouraging to actually substantiate the fact that how you eat matters and can actually treat your depression. So that's one way. But unlike medicine, it's not like you eat well for a week and okay, you it's going to take a while. So everything I'm suggesting is going to take a little while. Um, light therapy actually doesn't take as long as your diet change. Um, I think light therapy using a light box 
Um, now they have bright light therapy. Back in the day when I used to talk about light therapy, it was more blue light, um, a blue light light box. But now they have bright light and that's been studied more for treatment of depression. Blue light was more like adjusting your body clock and when you sleep and all of that. The bright light is more the therapeutic for both bipolar disorder and depression actually. For bipolar disorder, it's for the depressed phase of, of, of bipolar disorder. So I would, and I did do a video on that. I recommend you take a look. I think it's called bright light therapy. Um, I talk about using it in bipolar depression in that video, but I also mentioned the difference with, with unipolar depression. And really the difference is the time of day with bipolar disorder use it in the middle of the day with um, regular depression, you use it in the morning. Um, that actually has a more robust effect than diet. So I would actually highly recommend that. Um, video, let me see videos. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. I was looking at the chat. Um, bright light um, is mood lifting in general, just like when it becomes spring and the sun's out and you start feeling good and things like that. That's, you know, that's not a coincidence. Sunlight makes people feel better. Um, exercise. So I, the general recommendation is like a half, half an hour a day of exercise. And, you know, that takes discipline to do that. And the half hour is aerobic level. So if you're lifting weights, which is good for keeping your body toned and burning calories and all of that, that's, that would not be the half an hour. So don't, don't go and lift for a half an hour. You want to have some level of aerobic level exercise that gets your heart rate up, like walking fast, running, jogging, aerobics, something like that. Um, sleep. Maintaining at least seven to nine hours is the recommended amount for adults. And what do I mean by just get sleep? Well, I can't sleep, so how do I get sleep? Okay, yeah. So it's not like just get sleep. It's make, make sleep a priority. I always say, I think the preparation for sleep starts in the morning, not 30 minutes before you go to bed. What do I mean by that? So, so for me, I like structure my day to make it so that I can go to sleep at night. So I have my coffee here. I didn't, I didn't, I stopped drinking it because it makes my mouth dry. But um, I don't have coffee after noon because if the later you have coffee, the more it can interfere with your sleep. Some people say, I can drink coffee anytime. It doesn't make me have trouble sleeping. Okay, good for you. But in general, you want to eliminate caffeine substances several hours before you plan to go to bed. Um, you don't want to. Um, so I actually have a, um, a sleep hygiene card. I should have had it. Um, you know what I'll do? I'll link in the description of this, this um, sleep hygiene card that I created that has a countdown to bedtime. So it's like six hours before, don't do this. Four hours before, don't do this. Because there's all these little rules. And it's like, well, when do I do what? So it can feel very rulish at first, but it can, it should just get to where it becomes routine that you just know. So another thing is like not heating your body up too close to bedtime. So um, I've talked to people, you know, go to the gym at 10. Well, you're not, you're probably not going to be able to go to bed by midnight even, or be well after midnight because working out heats up your internal body temperature. So even if you come home, you feel like, well, it's not hot in my house. Your, your internal body is still elevated and it has to drop to precipitate sleep. So I don't want to, I could, I could do a whole thing on sleep, but when I say sleep, I mean prioritizing your sleep to do the things that you need to do to make sure that you get enough sleep and have it not be that you just sleep when the day's over. That sleep is like an event that starts at this time and you start thinking about how you're gonna make that happen when you first wake up in the morning. Okay, other things would be like um, supplements like omega-3s, uh, supplements. I always just say fish oil, but some people don't 
like some people don't eat fish, there are uh, vegetarian sources of fish oil. Um, flaxseed is another source of um, omega, but you have to get a lot more of it to get the same amount that you would get in a fish oil tablet. Um, studies there, so fish oil has been studied as an adjunctive treatment for depression, anxiety, as well as ADHD. The, the usual doses that I've seen in those studies though, are two to three grams, which is double, triple what you, what's recommended on the bottle. So if you go buy in the store, it'll say to take two of the capsules and the big old gel caps, but really for a more therapeutic effect, it would be more like four of those or six of those. Um, there are some uh, brands, Nordic Naturals happens to be one that I'm familiar with, but there's other ones. It's kind of more like a nutraceutical kind of company where it's more high end. Um, and they have them in places like Whole Foods here in the States, um, but they have a liquid version and the liquid version is more concentrated. So like a tablespoon of fish oil can give you the three grams. Now it's not always that easy to down oil, but you can mix it in your food. All right. For anxiety. Okay. A couple more things. Sorry. Then vitamin D3. There's a lot of people who are vitamin D deficient and don't realize it. Actually, the darker your skin, the more susceptible you are to it. Don't know why. Um, well, it has something to do with melanin blocking, but anyway, so sunscreen as well blocks the absorption of the um, vitamin D into your skin. So the biggest source of vitamin D is not from milk and fortified foods. It's actually from sun exposure and then it's made in your skin. That's where we get the bulk of it. So if you never go outside or spend a lot of time working indoors, you can be vitamin D deficient and, and that does contribute to depression. Um, behavioral activation. I may do a video on, on this, but that's a whole type of therapy that people will use to help with depression. And all it really is, I, you know, sometimes I say to myself, why is this a therapy? But all it really is, is coming up with ways, with activities that you make yourself do. Because when people get depressed, they tend to just do nothing. And that just perpetuates things. So getting up and getting dressed, um, making a plan that you're going to um, go do something to give yourself some purpose each day. Um, I'm just glossing over behavioral activation. It's, it's, you know, it's a little more to it than that, but that's just kind of the overview of it, of planning activities that you make yourself do even when you don't feel like it. As far as the anxiety is concerned, There's meditation, if you can sit through it. There's apps that help you do that. Yes, Headspace is one, a Calm app. Um, distraction activities, doing things that make you feel good, think, doing things that you like, um, that give you pleasure. What if you nothing gives you pleasure? Well, then you need to find something that gives you pleasure. Surely there's something that you can get into and maybe that's part of a problem for you, not necessarily for you, but for some people is they don't feel like they have any other purpose other than to get up and go to work, which a lot of people aren't doing right now. So even more important, it is to find something that gives you purpose. That could be giving back to other people. Um, practicing gratitude is another thing that can help with anxiety, appreciating the things that you do have. And you, and so coming up with like a, like some people have a gratitude journal, but even just a list of things that you sit down and think of, you come up with ahead of time of I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful that I have a roof over my head or that I have space in my house. I'm thankful, you know, whatever it is. And then go over those things. You start feeling anxious, start focusing on the things that you have, because that is a reflect, like the things that you have helps send a signal to your head that there are things that are good. But when you get anxious, it tends to be about worrying about future things or worrying or ruminating over past negative things. 
But focusing on what you're grateful for brings you into the moment and appreciating the good things that you have. Um, and then yoga and tapping, actually. So I'm going to, so tapping is um, a, a term for the a short version of um, EFT, emotional freedom technique is the actual term. And it's something that I just recently got into. I think it's great. And what it is, is it combines um, the theory or the, the idea behind acupuncture and acupressure using the meridians um, with um, expressing your emotions and accepting your emotions. So the tapping, just a quick overview, I'm not going to like do a tapping session right now, but in general, what you would do, just kind of take a little bit of the mystery out of it if you have, if out of it, if you have no idea um, what it is, is um, you the the spots that that are usually tapping spots are the outside of your hand. Um, there's a bunch on the face, but now there's kind of a modified way to do this so that we're not touching our face. So other points would be, I'm not going to go down too far. But um, see my collarbone here, or my clavicles? Um, you find your collarbone and go down just a little further. So right underneath here, that's another tapping point. The top of your head is another point. Um, your wrist here is another tapping point. And then um, another one, this is kind of, I think, like a modified version. But again, the face ones are big ones. But here on the outside of your hand. So um, I might get, I, you know what, I think there's another question I had that uh, about panic attacks that I will cover this, the tapping issue again. But I do recommend an app. It's called uh, the Tapping Solution. And it has great um, pre-made tapping meditations that I think you would find very helpful. Okay, and then yoga. Jessica asks, 10 months ago, I was involved in a car accident where I was on a motorbike and collided head on with a moving vehicle. I suffered a mild head injury. Thankfully, I'm better now. However, I'm suffering Symptoms of PTSD, such as nightmares, flashbacks, and panic attacks. I've been on a plethora of SSRIs for my depression and anxiety prior to the accident. And now I'm comfortable with an SNRI. That's a serotonin noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor like Effexor or Cymbalta. My biggest concern is the nightmares. They always come, they're, they're always a form of extreme violence. And I never feel rested after a night's sleep. I'm seeing a psychologist, but wondering if I should consider changing medication again because of these symptoms. So I'm glad you're seeing a psychologist. And um, I was going to say, I think Jessica, I'm glad you're seeing a psychologist. Yes, uh, because trauma therapy is definitely where you should go with your, the kind of therapy that you're getting. And there's different modalities that they will use. Um, EMDR is just one of the modalities that people will use to process trauma. But um, a medication that, as far as medications go, a medication that we will use specifically for nightmares is a medicine called Prazosin. And that's spelled, I always mess it up, P-R-A-S-O-Z-I-N or P-R-A-Z-O-S-I-N. I always have to look at it. But it's an it's an it's a blood pressure medicine that we use off label to treat nightmares, and um, it's something that keep in mind. If so, your doctor would have to start that the one that's using the SNRI with you. Um, as far as that, the S the SNRI. Hold on. Some antidepressants can worsen nightmares or even make people have very vivid dreams. 
So it's not, so let's say you had no trauma. Antidepressants can cause vivid dreams and make it look like you can wake up feeling like, did I, was that a dream or is that real? And it can feel very spooky to the point where you're like, remember I told you blah, blah. And it's like, no, well, actually that was a dream. So it can be like real stuff that's so vivid that it's, it's hard to know what's real, what's not real. But sometimes it can also be frightening for people. So I guess it's important for your doctor, for you to talk to your doctor about the onset of the nightmares to see, make sure that your, um, your antidepressant isn't worsening your nightmares by making them more vivid. That would be a reason to change antidepressants. Any of them can do it, but not all of them do. And then the other consideration is the medicine that I mentioned, Praesacin. Okay, Jacqueline, can you explain a way to exteriorize feelings? Due to childhood trauma, I have suppressed all so much and it affects my relationships. Okay, finding a way to externalize your feelings. Um, when you have a history of suppressing your feelings. I think one place to start would be on this issue or on this, um, going back to the emotional intelligence that I talked about um, earlier in this video. And I also talk about it in the video I just did last week on being an emotional sponge and being able to appreciate what your feelings are. If you've been in the, if you've grown up suppressing your feelings because it's not safe to talk about your feelings or you've been told um, someone doesn't really validate your feelings, which is pretty common for people. If you have an adult or a parent caretaker who's not comfortable with anger, say you get angry and then they make, they punish you or chastise you for being angry or it's not ladylike to be angry or something, um, then you can grow up feeling as though it's not okay to be angry. But that's a normal emotion we all have. It's just how do you, how do you express it in, in, a, in a way that doesn't cause a lot of problems? So um, I think that one, go take a look at my um, video, because I do think that if you are used to not being able to express your feelings, you're going to have trouble even identifying what they even are in the first place. So you might feel bad, but what is bad? Is bad um, demoralized? That might not even be a word you're used to using. Is bad um, insulted? Is bad taken advantage of? You know, so getting better at prompting yourself to identify what you actually feel and then getting into the exercise of someone that something happens. And then even if someone's not around, let's say it wasn't an argument, like let's say you experience something and you get off the phone or you stop watching television or something and you you're left there feeling like, um, go, it, it would be, the exercise would be to practice saying, I feel blah, whatever that is. Um, and on with that, that video that I did, there's also some these emotions cards that you can download that give you just, it can increase your vocabulary on some other emotions that you could be experiencing, but you didn't really realize that that was really how you felt. And so get in the habit of practicing, I feel blah. So print them out, cut them out. They're like little cards and get into the habit of when you feel bad about something or even good, it doesn't all have to be bad, of I feel this. And then the next step beyond that would be if this has to do with relationships and conflict or, or even talking with people, get in the habit of saying, you know, that such and such made me feel this. Or when we were told that we couldn't do this, that made me feel unappreciated. And then see how people respond to you. I mean, if you've got friends who aren't used to you talking about yourself, they may welcome it and feel like, oh, yeah, that made me feel that way too. Or they may be like, what's gotten into you? 
Now, if you do have someone who responds to you that way, like a, a like a, a partner who, I don't want to go down this road too long, but a partner who likes the fact that you don't speak up very much and then you start becoming more assertive with expressing how you feel and that person starts to try and tear you down for that, um, that's when you work on becoming even stronger with more resolve about this is how I feel and you need to accept how I feel. Okay, I know that's not what you asked and so I won't dilly dally too much on that. Okay, um, so Naya asks another question, how do you handle a parent or family member who loves to play the victim in every situation imaginable, nothing is ever their fault. So um, the, this, is, this is not easy. And what it really, because you're not going to be able to change this person, Sonaya. What is, what's this really going to boil down to is you setting your own limits. So with victimization, people are not accepting responsibility for whatever it is that has happened. And they don't put, they don't put themselves at the forefront of, of it or see their role in it. So it's always, we call it externalizing blame. Um, so the limits, the way to set limits, there's kind of two ways or two things that I could think of um, kind of off the top of my head is one is realizing that you're not going to change this person. You're not going to be able to give them insight. Like this is, things are never your fault. That's not going to, they're not going to say, oh yeah, you know, you're right. Okay. And they're, they're not going to change. So all it's going to do is make them defensive um, and make them mad at you. And then now it becomes about you and them instead of them in the world. So that's one thing, just accept. You're not going to change this person. So there's no, there's no point in you trying to um, help them see the problem. Secondly, is protecting yourself from being pulled down the road of whatever it is that they're, they're like focused on. So um, I'm just trying to think of a quick example. Someone says, um, I, um, you know, I, I don't know, I can't think of a quick example, but a lot of times when someone's verbalizing to you some um, thing that they're ticked off about because of what somebody else did, and you know full well, that's it's because of them. They're trying to get you to just engage with them at this complaining level. And you don't want to get pulled down that. So the thing to do would be to listen. And you don't want to ignore them, but listen. And, you know, that's a shame. Or, you know, whatever it is that you would say that sounds somewhat sincere, you don't want to come off as sounding, yeah, that's too bad. Anyway, you don't want to sound that way, because then they're just going to get mad at you. But say something to acknowledge that you heard them, and then change the subject, or say, yeah, you know, what do you think you can do to fix that? Or um, have you thought of any way that you can make that situation better? Like, get them turn it on them as to, well, what kind of solution do you think you could have for that? And if they say, oh, I don't need to do anything, it's because why should I have to blah, blah, blah? An answer could be, well, I mean, you don't have to. I just thought maybe if you wanted it to change, you, you might want to do something. Well, I don't need to. It was so-and-so. She shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then just let them, you know, be unhappy about that. But don't... So that's what you got to do. You kind of build a wall around. Don't fix them. Don't get pulled in to the stuff and keep trying to push it back on them. Of, well, what do you think you want to do about that? Now, you still need to say that in a non-confrontational way. So you know, what are you going to do about it? it? I mean, tone is everything. So you still want to be, you know, pleasant about it. Okay. Style life. Style life. I have a question. I'm clinically diagnosed with major depressive disorder and I have hypomania mania, but it lasts hours. Then my mood switch really fast to a super irritable mood. Is it bipolar disorder? Sorry, my English is not good. Um, if you, you've been clinically diagnosed with depression, 
And then you have hypomania that lasts for a couple of hours is this bipolar disorder. So mania or hypomania lasts more than hours. It needs to last. Uh, hypomania is about four days of symptoms and it's a group of symptoms. And um, mania is about a week of a group of symptoms. What could be happening is what you are calling hypomania just may be that you're feeling so much better than the way you were when you're depressed. And I've seen this a lot. Uh, people will say, well, I got hypomanic, but that's just, that's just not depressed. They're, they're depressed so long that finally when they feel good, they, it's like, well, I must be hypomanic. And I'll ask, okay, well, can people tell? And how, well, what are you doing when you're, well, I just, I feel really good. And, um, you know, I want to get stuff done. I get a lot done. How much to get done? Well, you know, I got, I got my, this project that I was working on done, or I was, I finished sewing this thing. Okay. And then any, well, what's wrong with, so sewing something is hypomania or feeling good is hypomania. Those feelings are so foreign that it, it must be hypomania. Hypomania is, is still a problem. It's not as severe as mania, but it's still, it still causes some degree of problem at some level and is usually noticeable. So feeling good might look like, um, you know, the person has got all these ideas and they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. And instead of getting this one project done, they got all these projects done. Now they're painting and they're up and blah, 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 blah. So it's more than just, I feel good because feeling good, we should feel good and being really happy. You can be really happy uh, without that being hypomania. And especially if you're really happy for a couple of hours, that's not, that's, that's not hypomania. So it may just be that you're having fleeting emotions um, that aren't necessarily wrapped up in depression or bipolar disorder or any disorder. And one other thing about this that I've seen over the years is that people, um, when they get a, when, when they have a mental disorder or like depression or, or hypomania, and it's been, it's taken a big hit to them, then they question anything that they feel is, is, well, now is this um, something wrong, you know, something wrong with me because of this now. And so, be careful. You got to allow yourself to have a certain level of emotional variation without it necessarily being a disorder. Especially if it's not causing problems. Okay. Desiree. Um, I'm in New York and as of nine days ago, started having massive panic attacks. I'm doing everything to stay calm and they're, they are just happening out of nowhere. I would like some advice on how to control it. So um, two things I'd recommend for you, Desiree. I would recommend practicing breathing exercises on a regular basis. Um, I think right now with the way things are, it's very easy to under breathe. Um, and I'll just speak for myself. I have that tendency when I go to the grocery store or go out at all, I find myself holding my breath and not really realizing that's what I'm doing. But I would say in general to keep anxiety under control. So this wouldn't be just when you're having a panic attack. This would be at any time, but especially um, when you're having a panic attack, but to practice um, deep belly breathing, it's called. So you would inhale and like count to three, uh, sorry, count to four. So you take a deep breath, three, four. It's hard for me to breathe and count at the same time, but you would do that counting in your head. You'd hold it for like a second and then exhale and count to four in your head. When you do that, you want, you can put your hand on your belly. You can't see mine. There it is. And you would want to feel it kind of move out in and out because that's how you're expanding your lungs. It's easy for us to just kind of sit and, and not really breathe all that deeply. So you want to do, and it can feel very cleansing to do these kind of deep breaths in and out. It's just kind of, it's, it's something you can do to just kind of feel 
grounded before you do something. So I'm going to sit down and do this. I'm going to take some deep breaths. In and out. Okay, and then now I'll get started. In the setting of a panic attack, if you have the control to be able to stop and breathe, that's one way to actually short circuit the panic attack because when you are in panic or a lot of anxiety, you tend to hyperventilate and huff and puff. And then that, um, that uh, buildup of carbon dioxide from like the not taking in deep breaths and exhaling um, can perpetuate even more um, panic and anxiety. A second thing is I would recommend the tapping for you. So I mentioned this earlier and you can almost use tapping as something and that's the EFT um, to address mul a multitude of issues. Some people use it for pain, um, for panic. You could do something like focusing on, um, let's say a panic attack. So this will just be a quick example of how you could do this. So you start out with a setup statement and you, you say something like, um, even though I have this problem, in this case, I'm having this panic, even though, and then you give an acceptance statement, I give myself permission to relax. Or another statement someone might say is I give, I completely and deeply accept myself. So that setup statement you would do by starting out with the outer part of the hand. So this is the place you start. So you would say something like, I'm just gonna do an, rather than kind of talking through it, I'm just gonna do an example. So for you, if I were doing this, I might be like, even though I have all of this, I have panic, these panic attacks, I completely and deeply accept myself. And I do it two more times like this, even though blah, 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 I completely and deeply accept myself. Then I'd move to my next, place and I would talk about, I would just express my feelings. You kind of like freestyle how you're feeling um, and mention it. Cause what you're doing is you're bringing aloud um, the negative emotions that you're having. It's and they'll refer to it as pulling out the weeds. So all this anxiety, all this anxiety, if you can't think of what to say, like, um, you know, something more therapeutic sounding or complex sounding like I'm experiencing, I mean, my anxiety makes me um, inefficient at home, makes me not be able to take care of my family. Like if you can't say all that, you can just say this, all this anxiety, and you go to the next place. All oh, my heart is racing, my this racing heart. I feel like I'm going to collapse. Go to the next place. When I have trouble breathing, I just feel like I'm going to collapse. You can keep repeating the same thing. Another spot I forgot is under the arm. And you go, it's my armpit. Under the arm, about a hand width underneath and tap that. You could either do it with one hand or both hands. So all this anxiety, I can't even sleep. So you would go through all the points. Then the second time around, you go, you do it again, but then you kind of say more accepting things. So even though I tend to get anxiety and panic, I completely and deeply accept myself or I will be able to relax. I will be able to calm down and function. This is not going to keep me from getting through the rest of my day. So this is a real kind of botched <laughs> um, example. I'm just trying to give you, I'm just trying to make it quick. But you would go through all of the different sections and you kind of do, you could do two rounds of it. So the first round tap on the tap points would be just expressing the negative emotions. The second round ideally would be saying something positive about how you feel um, or a positive result or a, a desire you have. So um, you want to be able to stop panicking so that you can, you, you can, you can get sleep or so that you can 
um, take care of your family or so that you can work or you can focus. So I will be able to focus. I'm going to be able to calm down and da, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So as I mentioned, um, the tapping solution though is a good app. It's on my phone um, that has these pre-made, they have several free ones, by the way. So it is one of these freemium apps where you download it free, you get access to a certain number of them. And then they have upgrade to a paid version where you get access to all of them. But even the free ones are still very good. And there's quite a few of them. All right. Next. Um, Tazias. Hello, Dr. Tracy. I want to ask, how do you stop overthinking and how to get off of lorazepam addiction? Wow. Okay. So overthinking and lorazepam addiction, those are two, two very different problems. The overthinking part, um, that I'd need to kind of ask you some more questions to figure out what you mean by that and how that how that manifests, like some more context on that. And that's what a therapist would do if they were trying to like help you with the overthinking, because sometimes people overthink because of anxiety. And it's, it, it's, a, it's one of the ways that you can have distorted thoughts of catastrophizing. That's uh, one example of co a cognitive distortion, we call it. Um, and there's like whole exercises involved with recognizing what those thoughts are and um, finding and like creating what's the evidence that these thoughts are going to be are true. Why are you why am I so focused on it? Maybe maybe it's actually not true and reevaluating the thought. Sometimes you can overthink because you don't have a lot of confidence in your decision making or in yourself period. So you overthink things because that's the way you deal with the fact that you don't feel good about making a decision. Um, sometimes you overthink because um, you have OCD. And I'm not saying you have OCD. I'm just saying some people with OCD, that is one thing they can do is overthink. So how do you stop overthinking? It depends on the reason you're overthinking. And those are just a couple of things off the top of my head as far as things to think about as sources. Um, as far as Ativan addiction, that kind of detox requires medical intervention. I do not recommend you just doing that on your own um, because it can, it can be very tricky and it also depends on how far how high of a dose that you got up to uh, generally when I don't do detoxes. Okay. But so a detox really is um, like you can go to a program where it's a medical detox and they're, they're using a different medication to get you off of the medicine. So in that case, they'd use a longer acting benzodiazepine to get you off the lorazepam which is, so they take one that's longer acting than the lorazepam and kind of wean you down. Um, kind of a general rule of thumb that uh, people will use um, to wean someone off of a medication like that is to kind of reduce it by 50% over some time period. And that time period is where the, it gets, um, it is where there's clinical judgment involved so whether that time, a short period of time of weaning down 50% could be, so like, let's say someone were taking two milligrams three times a day, which is, that's a lot of Ativan. Um, two milligrams three times a day. I said Ativan, lorazepam. A 50% reduction would be one milligram three times a day. You bring, so you keep the dose the same, the interval the same, bring it down. And then how long you stay there could be a fast, might be like a couple, like, might be like a week. Really slow if you've been on it a long time, could be months. I've had some people where um, I change their dose like every three months when I see them because we really are trying to go super slow. So the longer you've been on it, the longer the taper should be. You don't wanna just a couple weeks and you're off if you've been on it for years. But again, this isn't something you should do on your own. People do it on their own and they figure it out and they just kind of break up pills and take a little, 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 little. Okay. But 
Um, really, the recommendation is to get guidance, medical guidance on how to do it. Um, and but in general, the longer you've been on it, the longer it should go. All right. And, you know, even a year is not unreasonable to get off of that medication, uh, off of a benzodiazepine if you've been taking it for years. All right. Um, Sophia Jones, this is question 29. I don't think I'm going to make it to 75. That was my goal. I've been going, it's almost two hours. There's still 347 people on. So if you guys want me to keep going, I will. If it trickles down to like two of you, <laughs> then I might just stop, but I'll keep going for now. So Sophia, I tend to worry about something in particular, and then the next day I will have ectopic heartbeats, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, etc. It will feel like I have a heart condition. My heart has been checked out many times and all and is all healthy. Could these symptoms be just a form of worrying? Yes, they can be a form of worrying. Chest, uh, heart, prop, heart issues um, can be a sign of anxiety. Again. Disclaimer, I'm not saying it is, but it can be. So people can manifest anxiety physically or um, cognitively, we call it, uh, as far as your thought process or both. Physical, so cognitive anxiety would be like worrying, catastrophizing. I'm thinking and catastrophizing, I didn't define it before, is anticipating the worst case scenario. So I feel my heart. Um, a little twitch in my heart, I'm going to have a heart attack. Or um, because of the economy right now, we're going to lose our home. Now, is it is that a reasonable option? Maybe, but for my mind to like immediately go to everybody in my house is going to die because we're going to end up on the street and we can't, we're not going to be able to live. Like that might sound ridiculous to someone who doesn't think that way, but people who think that way, that's how they think. So, um, so where was I with your question? Um, I don't know. I got down a rabbit hole with that. Sorry about that. So let me take another look at your question. Sorry. I got off track. Cause I was thinking about somebody who does that um, in my own life. And I hear stuff like that. Um, oh, so your heart can, so yes, yeah, so that's cognitive, and that's where I was with this, sorry. So that's cognitive anxiety, kind of worrying about stuff, da, da, da. But there are people who have physical anxiety and they're not thinking anything. They're not worried about anything, but all, they just feel like this tenseness. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I feel pain in my chest. It can just be this like, um, just feel just tight and just, just weighed down tense. It can be um, trouble breathing. Um, it can be things like flushing, like all of a sudden feeling warm, um, heat on the top of your head. I've heard people complain of that. Um, dry mouth. Uh, so, you know, you go to give a talk and your mouth is like cotton mouth. You can't even speak. So all that to say, um, yes, you can have anxiety can manifest only physically and it can be untriggered. So you can just be do, 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 and then boom, have heart racing. OK, that tends to be a harder anxiety to deal with because of the fact that you it doesn't make sense in your head. Oh, yeah, I saw my child fall down the stairs. OK, that's why my heart's racing. Um, but instead it's like you did, it's, it's all, it's like that did happen or you feel the same way as if that happened, but nothing happened. You could be sitting outside these days. We're spending a lot of time sitting in the driveway, old school, but you could be sitting in the driveway, relaxing. And then all of a sudden, so, and, and why does that happen? Sometimes it can just be because, um, you just have a hyped up. Um, you just have a hyped up system, but sometimes it can be more unconscious thoughts, not unconscious, meaning you were asleep, but beyond your awareness. So 
you're not trying, like, let's, let's go back to the sitting out on the driveway, like I'm doing these days. If I could be sitting out on the driveway, my husband's talking about something, the news, and um, all of a sudden, like, in my head, like, I start feeling tense, and it had nothing to do. Thank you so much, CA, for the $5 um, super chat. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, he says something, but all of a sudden I think like my brain goes to, uh, oh, something. And I may not even be aware that that's what I'm thinking. It just, it happened because of some like vulnerability I have. I'm worried about, um, my, my elderly parents, um, getting sick because they're living with me. Um, I'm worried about that. So he said something and that triggered that. And still in my head, I'm not thinking, I'm worried about them getting sick. I'm just, I'm not necessarily thinking about them, but all of a sudden I just start getting anxious. So all that to say, I know I'm going on too long with this, but you can have physical anxiety that's triggered by something that you're aware of or not aware of. What do I recommend? Doing the relaxation activities that I've talked about previously. Tapping is one, breathing exercises, guided meditations, and there's plenty of apps. There's even YouTube, plenty of YouTube videos on giving you guided meditations that you can just watch and listen to. Um, and then distraction is another thing as well. Finding things to keep yourself occupied with pleasurable activities um, to help keep you moving, moving and grooving so that you're not like getting worked up over stuff. Okay. Number 30, question number 30, Masego. Hi, Doc. My question here is, what is the theory behind people pleasers? And are all people pleasers liars? <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, not to laugh at your question. I, liars? Like, where would that come from? I was just trying to think of how that could appear as though someone's lying. I, I, okay, I guess if like someone's saying, do you like this? Uh-huh. Even though I know I don't like it, but I'm just saying that because I don't want to make you mad. Um, okay. Yeah. That's a lie, but not. Okay. All right. Let, let me just rewind. Let me at, answer the question and get off that liar part. Um, there's not one theory behind people pleasers. People please People want to please for different reasons. And um, so there's just not kind of one answer to that. Um, there, you know, your need to make people happy can be that you just, and I don't mean you because it sounds like you're talking about other people who are people pleasers. Um, so, okay, wait. So going back to the like, are they liars? And the example I gave of someone asking my opinion, oh, you like this, right? And I don't, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. So I say yes. Um, you know, some of it may just be that um, I don't have enough confidence about myself. Uh, my self-esteem is low. So I'm too afraid to be, to assert my real opinion about things. So this is more gen generically. So someone with, without, um, with low confidence or low self-esteem can fall into a mode of people pleasing because people pleasing isn't a symptom or a characteristic per se. It's a behavior. Um, just trying to think of another reason people could be people pleasers. Um, people who like to take care of people and make people feel good about themselves can be someone who is willing to just kind of do things, um, for others, even if it comes at a cost for them. Um, people in caretaking positions or, or uh, jobs can be this way. Um, doctors, nurses, people who want to help people. Um, I fall into this at times with, you know, it just, I was just sick about the fact that I didn't get to everybody's questions. I mean, yesterday, Sunday, I spent my time putting this document together of all of the questions, like cutting and pasting questions and indexing them so that I could do the like timestamp thing. That took a good portion of the day. And there were all these questions that came through and I just felt terrible, but I felt like, but for my own sake, I need to not, 
I need to walk away and just have some downtime and not, but I still, I still feel bad about it. So, um, you know, is that some personality flaw I have? I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's, a, it's a, it, it, it probably is part of my temperament, which is why I chose psychiatry. I think, um, why I chose to be a psychiatrist is wanting to help people with their mental pain. And I know I've always been that way. Even before I became a doctor, it was about, I could see someone who was um, hurting or like at school, someone who, you know, no one wanted to talk to this person. Well, then I'd want to be their friend. It's like, I'll be your friend. Um, that's my personality. Um, can it go too far? Yeah, it can go too far. So the whole people pleasing thing, there can be good aspects of that. And then there can be negative aspects where it goes too far, where you sacrifice your own wants and desires for the sake of other people. And that's where it goes more into the negative realm. But kind of innocent, I'm not going to tell you what I really think about the way you look kind of stuff. You know, is anybody going to be mad about that? I guess it just depends on how honest you want people to be. All right. Next, Ebony and Ivory live together in perfect. All right. I can't sing. If you know what reference that is, let me know. I just had to say that. I, I could not not say that. My mouth had to say that. All right. What are your tips regarding self-care especially if one suffers from anxiety. Okay, so I'm Ebony, I've, Ebony and Ivory, um, rewind, or you may have been watching and saw that I already answered this question, but I would say as a recap, prioritizing um, sleep, making that as, as um, something that you think about how it's going to happen at the beginning of the day, and really all that means is set your bedtime. A lot of people, I ask everybody who comes to see me, um, how's your sleep? A lot of people say terrible. I say, what time you go to bed? It depends. That is mostly what I hear. It depends. So what time you go to sleep shouldn't depend. Just set a time. You might say, well, it has to depend. I've got stuff to do and da, 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 da. Okay, maybe there are circumstances where you just, there's no way you can control your own sleep but that's probably not the case. You could, there's, this is a limit setting issue. So so-and-so needs me and this person, da, da, da. If you say my bedtime is 10, end of story. I go to my room, y'all all take care of yourselves. Okay, if you got an infant, things like that, you can't do that. But for the most people, you, you probably can have, you, pro you do have more control than you think over your ability to do some of these things. So you have to allow yourself to be able to just say, draw a line in the sand and say, this is what I'm going to do. So you're going to prior prioritize your sleep, you're going to practice um, relaxation, whatever form that takes. You may not enjoy meditation. So that is not the be all end all for everyone. So it's not like if you're not meditating, then just why are you even talking to me? Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. No, I mean, it doesn't work for everyone. I get that. Try though, and with the apps, it makes it easier. And the way I say try is, I see it as just a quieting, calming, bringing yourself into the here and now moment as a way to um, settle down. So anxiety is driven by worries of the past, worries of the future. It's it's it. You're not in the moment. So mindfulness is something you can do just with anything, even with your, when you're eating. How many people are eating and thinking about, okay, I got to do this and this as soon as I finish. Da, da, da. Mindful eating would be um, the fork is, you know, thinking about how the fork feels in your hand, thinking about how the food feels in your mouth, um, what's the texture of it. Uh, the taste, the smell, like you engage all of your senses in the moment. Um, that's mindful in eating. Washing your face in the morning. Are you washing your face thinking about, oh, I got to, you know, I got to go get my cup of coffee. Don't do that. 
wash your face and feel the how how the soap feels on your if you use soap, but how you know, I think you get what I'm saying. So you can practice mindfulness in any situation without it being this. Um, and I mean, not everybody can do that. Clear your mind. But mindfulness is another form of is another way of meditating, really. But it's it's it, it's not it's beyond that. It's it also has to do with kind of a way of thinking. So I would I would highly recommend even doing practicing mindfulness in your everyday life with everything that you're doing. I have this problem. I'm at the I'm at, if I if I'm at a light, I can't even sit there 30 seconds. The light is probably red for 30 seconds, and it feels like I'm being held up. And I want to reach for my phone, even though we can't in Georgia, you can't have your phone in your hand. So I have it sitting on the on the seat next to me. I want to I have to force myself not to want to check a text message or something. And I have to keep driving. And so it's it's it takes work. OK, next, Jesse, Jesse, S, Z, X, yeah, I can't talk. That's because I need some water. Hold on. Y'all are hanging in there, troopers. Still over 300 people here. Y'all are troopers. Thank you. I'll keep going then. My voice is not gone. Jesse S-Z-K. I would love to know more about comorbid bipolar type 1 with borderline personality disorder. I'm currently on meds and go to therapy. Sometimes I mean to go and want to go, but it seems like the disorders cancel the other one out. I went to DBT class years ago, but only went twice. And in recent years, I've had the therapist basically tell me they refuse to continue to work with me unless, excuse me, unless I do DBT. But there's no way I can go every week unless I was manic, meaning I tend to only take care of myself and responsibilities when I'm in that phase. It's hard to go when I'm in the other phase, depression, and can't even get out of bed and wish I hadn't woken up at all. And don't even bother calling to cancel my appointments because I just don't care to even be alive and let alone care about getting on the phone. So I guess my question is, is there an easier way to help me be able to try to find some sort of balance so I can continue trying to improve my mental health. Have you ever had any patients that were in the same boat and learned any techniques from them? Wow, Jesse, I hope you don't mind me adding some emotion to your question. Um, okay, so kind of to recap what she's saying, what was my little summary? Um, oh, how to find balance with bipolar and borderline is how I sum this up. But I hear what I hear what you're saying. So what she's saying is she's got borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder, two different, two different illnesses. Um, we actually a term people refer to that as border polar, border polar. That's not easy to say. Um, and I was actually thinking about doing a video on that at some point. And the treatment for both are different. So bipolar disorder, it's predominantly medication. However, social rhythm therapy is another therapy that's a very good um, treatment or treatment for bipolar disorder. I don't think it's robust enough to, to, for it to keep you off medication. Um, however, Okay, and then let me just finish this thought. And then bipolar, sorry, uh, borderline personality disorder, the mainstay treatment is dialectical behavior therapy, the DBT. So, um, so people with both, it's preferable to get both of those therapies and two different people more than likely would be doing the therapy. You'd have a psychiatrist prescribing your medications and, um, a therapy program doing the DBT. They're usually group settings, and then they may have some individual sessions as well. <clears throat> All right, my throat was starting to give out on me. 
No. The borderline personality disorder will manifest as mood instability, just like bipolar disorder as well, but it's a little different kind of mood instability, more mood instability that may change day to day, hour to hour, versus um, the bipolar disorder where you have these episodes that last a certain chunk of time. All right, so all that to say, she's saying, the only way I can really keep up with going to weekly therapy, which is what the DBT is, is if I'm in a manic phase. Because if I'm depressed and bottomed out depressed, there is no way I'm talking for you, Jesse. Sorry. There is no way I'm getting up. Because people will get to where they can't eat. They just can't even get out of bed. Um, the idea of like, I don't know if this is how you feel, Jesse, so I'm not speaking for you necessarily. But it can be like, you open your eyes and it's like, and it's, it's like to get through the day anyway. It, it's so the idea of like, I got to get on the phone and cancel my appointment, which by the way, I know they hate no shows, but um, so she's saying that when she's, she's too depressed, she doesn't have the energy nor even the mental fortitude to like have a schedule and get up. Um, this is where behavioral activation that I mentioned earlier comes into play during your depressed phases. And maybe I will do a separate uh, video on behavioral activation. Um, I do know uh, Dr. Todd Grande, G-R-A-N-D-E, he has like over 1500 videos um, on his channel, but I know he has a couple of videos already on behavioral activation. If you want to look that up before I get around to making a video on it, but essentially what it is, it's, it's the idea that if you get depressed people active and moving, you can, that alone can improve your depression. It seems like, well, how does that help? So what's, how does getting up and walking around the block really help? but it does. It just does. And thank you for the super chat, the $10 super chat. Thanks so much. Your thing is green with a little, looks like a doggy picture, but I don't see a name. So I'm sorry. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Jesse, what I think you're going to need to do when you're not depressed, when you do have the energy, come up with an activity list of things that you can do. And, and it, they may seem very basic, but it will make a difference. It won't be that basic when you're depressed because when you're depressed, everything's hard. But when you're not depressed, something like getting up and getting dressed and going to the grocery store, which I know these days is not that easy, but this is not gonna last forever. Um, Going to the grocery store might seem like, well, big deal. That's what I do all the time, but not when you're depressed, right? Because you're in the bed. So come up with a list of, I don't even know, five, 10 maybe, 10 maybe a lot, but five activities that take some time for you to do that require you to get up. All of them don't have to be getting out of your house. Some of them can be um, washing the dishes. No, and it doesn't have to be fun stuff. That doesn't sound fun, but washing the dishes, or so it could be chores. It could be calling someone. Uh, I need to call my mom and check on her. Um, it could be um, cooking dinner. I mean, it could be anything, but it needs to be something. Come up with these lists of things that you are going to schedule into your day when you get so depressed, when you get in that depressed phase. And then that becomes a mandate that you've got to do these things. So they do need to be things that are doable. Like it can't be, you know, organize my closet. That's not, that's hard to do anyway, but that's really going to be hard to do if you can barely even get out of the bed. Right. So it needs to be doable, chunkable kind of things that you can do. Keep yourself moving. Um, the other thing, though, and last thing on this question is making sure you're on a medication regimen. If you if you're not on a medication regimen, then that may be what the problem is. But if you're making if you're on medicines, making sure that your medication regimen is optimized to keep you in this 
um, this kind of shortened loop thing that I was mentioning before, the curve, and that you're not going, because it sounds like, I forgot what you said about what your mania is like, but it sounds like you're going, okay, so if, if the line, <laughs> my chair railing, if that's the line, no. If the line is like this, um, that maybe your mania is like this, and then your depression is like this, if you could, if your medicine can be optimized to bring the peaks in a little bit more so that you're not so bottomed out when you're depressed. Um, that could look like anticipating when you have your depression. Cause if you have a pattern to your depression, all the better. If you know, if you and your doctor know that every winter you get depressed or every few months you have a depress depressive episode, you can anticipate it. And then maybe your doctor add either a second mood stabilizer or a little bit of an antidepressant to help keep you from getting to where you can't get out of bed um, and then take it off when you start to come out of it. I mean, you would stay on it a little bit, but then take you off to keep you from getting too manic. That's my thoughts on that. And I hope um, you feel better, uh, Jesse, and are able to get more stable. Okay, Saqib. Sorry if I mispronounce names. Any long-term negative effects of antidepressants or PSSD? Uh, PSSD is post, uh, SSR, post SSRI sexual dysfunction. And Saqib, I've heard, you know, the only time I have heard this term a number of times, mostly in the comments of my videos. When I look it up on like the National Library of Congress, PubMed, things like that, where I normally look for research, I don't see anything about it. Does that mean it doesn't happen? No, it just means that we don't have good solutions, thoughts about why it happens, ways to keep it from happening, all that. There's just not much known about it officially. In my practice, I have not seen it. Um, I've had men, it's usually the men that, that complain of the um, sexual side effects. That's not true. Sorry. So I'll have women. So, okay. The women, it'll, it'll tend to be more sexual interest or desire. Um, also, um, uh, delayed climax can be another thing. And then um, with the men, it can be more, it can be interest as well, but then other dysfunction types, other physical dysfunction stuff. I don't want to get too graphic for this video in case there's underage people watching. Um, even though this is designed for 18 year olds and above. And anytime I have had someone complain what I have found is it's usually dose dependent. So I would go and reduce the medication or try a different one. When I would try a different one or reduce, it would go away. Like I had, I've had, I may have had a couple of people just stay on it, even though it got a little better, but didn't go all the way, all the way away from reducing because they felt so much better. They were just willing to put up with that. But um, I, I have not had anyone tell me after they, the medicine was taken off completely that they were still having trouble. So I just don't have much to say about antidepressants causing that. Um, one thing to look out for or to test for or have evaluated is your testosterone level. So um, I have had some people where they, they had some sexual dysfunction and it had and it was due to low testosterone, this would be in the men um, or women in menopause. So it may have looked like it was the antidepressant at first, but actually it turns out it was low testosterone levels. As far as other um, long-term effects of antidepressants, so the only one that I would throw into this mix of long-term effect, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's really a long-term, well, okay, let me just say it. So antidepressants can increase your risk of gastrointestinal bleeding, similar to the risk that you can get with 
NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Aleve and Motrin and things like that. So what I tell people about this is um, if you, you need to be aware that there's, that it has this risk because if you take something else later on, now you've got the additive risk. So an even more chance of having some kind of ulcer or, or gastrointestinal bleed. So that just means that if you're, you're taking, let's just say Prozac, I'll throw that out there. You're taking Prozac for years. You need to know that if you add other, you need to be aware that when you add other stuff like NSAIDs, um, you have this increased risk. So it's not as though all by itself, the medicine just kind of leaves you permanently damaged in some way, but it makes you have to be aware of other medications that you're taking and what effects those will have on your antidepressants or vice versa, what effect your antidepressant will have on other medicines. Okay, still going strong people. Who's next? Um, okay, Lillian, this is question number 35. Hey, I'm just curious on if you diagnose minors with any type of mental disorder or illness, or if you wait until they are 18. The answer to that is yes, people under 18 can be diagnosed with mental disorders. Um, depression, bipolar disorder um, can be present and oftentimes can start in the teen years. Uh, it, depression, that is. Depression and anxiety can start in the teen years. Bipolar disorder can look like anxiety in teen years and then later on kind of morph into what was, what was anxiety becomes mania or hypomania later on. So make sure you hear me right. I'm not saying that if your child's anxious, they're going to have bipolar disorder. No. What I am saying is that we, we have seen that adults with bipolar disorder, particularly bipolar one disorder, their history may have looked like anxiety starting in the um, kind of teenage, early teen years. And then, you know, it goes and then they get depressed and then the depression comes and goes. And then at some point they have a manic episode. Um, so yes, a, someone under 18 could be diagnosed with anxiety, um, depression, ADHD. That really is a disorder of childhood. Um, and that is a mental, that's considered a mental disorder. It, it's, it starts in your brain. So brain disorders or mental disorders. Um, I know we don't think of them that way. You know, if someone has a stroke, we don't think of that as a mental disorder, but I'm just using that broad term to mean affecting the brain. Next question, Emily H. Is it true that when you take SSRI for long enough, your brain will get used to them? I'm afraid that my brain might become immune to Prozac if I don't start taking, if I don't stop taking it. Emily, yes, you can develop a tolerance to antidepressants. I did not want to believe that was the case. And a lot of people didn't want to really believe that was the case. In a small segment of people, uh, it's believed that some people can develop a tolerance to the medicine such that it doesn't work anymore. Um, and from what I've seen, that's still a very small segment. It may just be that we don't fully understand, um, the cutoff for where it's tolerance, where it's not. And where I'm going with that is there's so many other reasons though, it can stop working. The kind of, um, generic medication that you take can affect effectiveness. So I've seen people who will take something for years. The pharmacy starts using a different generic provider or manufacturer, and then their symptoms change or they, they, they have a relapse and they start to feel more depressed or more anxious. And it was because of that manufacturer's um, medication just didn't work as well for them. So that is one. Um, 
Also, you can have shifts in your hormone levels. So going back to the testosterone for men or women, um, thyroid and thyroid for men as well. At any time, you can have shifts in your thyroid production. So an underactive thyroid can feel like depression. Um, so there are other intervening or, or other reasons that you can kind of be holding steady for a long time on your medicine and then it just not and seem to take a step back. Oh, another reason is what's called um, um, dopamine depletion syndrome. So you can take, um, I thought something cut off. You can take an antidepressant, um, a serotonin enhancing antidepressant for a while and then through a feedback mechanism, get a decrease in dopamine production Generally, that feels like apathy, like you just don't care. Uh, you can feel dulled emotionally, feel like, and I did um, in an, uh, a video um, called, I think it's called emotional blunting or blunting with antidepressants, something like that, where I talk about this. But that sense of feeling dulled and all that can feel like your depression is coming back when it's not that your depression is coming back, you're being dulled by the medicine. What's the solution to that? You can pull back on some of the medicine, decrease it a little bit, and sometimes that will help. Sometimes adding Wellbutrin will help. So long, long answer to can your antidepressants stop working? I actually did a video on can your antidepressants stop working? So take a look at that video. All right. Next, K alkali metal. Oh, alkali metal, okay. Hi, I've heard that if you have a mood disorder such as major depression, it's unlikely you will have cluster C personality disorder such as avoidant personality disorder. I would love to hear your opinion on this. I understand there's a lot of overlap with the symptoms, but I think it's possible to have both from experience. Thanks from the UK. Yay from the UK. Um, there's no personality disorder that's off the table if you have major depression. You, they're two separate processes, two separate designations, if you will. So um, anyone, so your personality, I call it your hardwiring. That's your, how you're, you know, it's based on temperament as well as upbringing. So nurture and your nature and your nurturing forms your personality. And um a personality disorder is one in which aspects of your personality causes problems. Okay. You can have then an overlie of a mood disorder or any kind of psychiatric disorder like anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder on top of your hardwiring. So um, as far as uh, so yeah, so there's no, from, from, from my thoughts, I don't see why, uh, you couldn't have avoidant personality disorder. If you have depression, it's not like, um, well, the depression gets, you know, it's not really depression. It's avoidant personality. That's, that's your problem. Well, avoidant people with avoidant personality disorder aren't necessarily depressed. Some are but not everyone. So, um, so anyway, all right, that's that. I hope that answers your question. Um, and keep in mind with avoidant personality, cause you said, uh, I, I know there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms. Uh, well, I don't know. So I did an, a, a video on avoidant personality disorder. You should take a look at it. Um, but kind of at, at the base of it is this fear of um, being rejected, criticized and things such that it keeps you from doing things and having relationships and so on and so forth. So that actually can look more like anxiety than look like depression. So there is a, there, there's probably more overlap between avoidant personality and anxiety. Okay, Yvette said, I have a question. I'm diagnosed with bipolar type two and I'm on a mood stabilizer and a tiny dose of an antidepressant. I also, uh, I have also clonazepam and Zolpidem, which is Ambien for as needed use. Lately, I have had to rely on one or the other 
nightly. I have to get sleep though, because I need the rest. I need the rest for my job. I'm a nurse. I'm worried about using the sleep aid so frequently these days. I do practice good sleep hygiene. Any suggestions? Um, so Yvette, thanks for your question. Ah, uh, so the, I don't have an easy, quick answer for that because one of the things about using sleep aids, particularly um, Zolpidem, Ambien, Lunesta is another one, and even the benzodiazepines when it comes to it, um, you can get rebound insomnia with them to where you don't sleep if you don't take them. And, you know, I've had some people, and, and when I say don't sleep, I don't mean like, oh, that wasn't a good sleep. I mean, like, zero sleep. And for most people, that's unacceptable. And so then they can't, they, so the next night, they're like, oh, that's not happening again. So they take it, they take, they keep, they resume it, and then they're stuck on it. So I warn people when I start with, I'm going to just going to say Ambien, because it's easier for me to say, that I, I don't want you to get stuck on Ambien. And that's what I mean by stuck on Ambien. Um, and so I will recommend that they not take it any more than like three nights a week for the most. So that you can skip days. And so maybe like take it. So they may take it. They may take it like to kind of catch up on sleep. So I've seen somebody who they haven't been sleeping for weeks and they need something. I'll say, okay, go ahead and take it. Let's get you caught up on some sleep and get you feeling better because lack of sleep can make you feel as though you're depressed. Lack of sleep, sleep deprivation can be a cause of being depressed or developing depression symptoms as well as anxiety. Um, so let's get you feeling better. And then and then I'll may see them back in a month and say, okay, it's okay if you took that every night. Then let's now switch to trying to see how you do going a couple of nights without take a night or two without taking it. And then maybe if the third night you don't sleep well, then take the medication. So if you're already, all that was to say, if you're already in this mode of taking something every single night, um, it's hard to, um, this, this, Sorry, if that, but this is more like a consultation because you you really need to talk with your doctor about maybe trying to switch you over to something else to get the that I'm I'm concerned about the um the and you mentioned anxiolytic I'm assuming you're talking about the clonazepam just for other people's sake um I'm I'm concerned about the effect that the clonazepam and the zolpidem is having in that it may have gotten you in a locked in state of you're not going to sleep, not because of stuff going on, but just because you're not taking that pill and that pill is the only thing keeping you sleeping. So uh, or withdrawal from that. So things like trazodone um, is a medicine that I might use um, with someone to help them wean to switch over from this taking trazodone every night, now you're back to still taking something every night. But it still doesn't have quite, it still doesn't have the rebound insomnia issue associated with it. Hydroxyzine is another medication um, that is sedating. It's a sedating antihistamine that can be used as a substitute to try and help somebody shift from Ambien to something else. Um, those, and then things like Seroquel, which I don't necessarily recommend as a, a regular sleep aid if you don't have a different reason for taking it, like having bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or depression, because it's very weight gaining, even at small doses. It knocks people out, but it's, it's very heavy. So those are just a few things as far as a medication Thing, and that would be for your doctor to kind of do some tweaking to see if he can kind of transition you off nightly Ambien. In the meantime, um, you know, once if you get off of it and end up on something else that you're taking every night, there's still this issue of, but I got to take something every night. How do I get past that? That's a bigger deal. That's a, not a bigger deal, a bigger, a longer process of trying to help with your sleep such that you don't need something for sleep. It could be that if you just get off the Zolpidem 
and on to something else more sedating or that could help you sleep without it, that, that you might be able to get to where you sleep on your own without. Currently, in the current time that we're in, you might just want to leave well enough alone for now and just decide that, you know, in a couple of months, I'm going to work hard with my doctor to make a shift, but not right now. Like now might not be the time to do that since you're working as a nurse and I can only imagine that you need your sleep. Okay. Number 38, Beverly. If someone is hurting or cutting his or herself because mixed emotions like anger and not doing angry. Okay. Let me start over. If someone is hurting or cutting his or herself because of mixed emotions, like being angry um, or not doing or done their task, like they fail accomplishing an, a task or something bad. Is it considered as bipolar or one of serious symptoms of depression? So that question is, if someone cuts himself in response to dealing with negative emotions, is that bipolar disorder, depression? No, not based on that alone. Um, people cutting and self-harm is a coping mechanism that different people can use. And, it, and it's not always uh, a part of a diagnosis. So it's very much associated with borderline personality disorder. Self-harm and things is one of the things that is, can be present with that disorder. There are people who have cut in the past that aren't necessarily, that aren't, that don't have bipolar, uh, sorry, don't have borderline personality disorder. Um, you can see teenagers doing this who are still trying to find themselves emotionally and things like that. A lot of, um, you know, maturity issues. So sometimes people um, will cut themselves to feel more, um, feel more real. So someone who has uh, episodes of depersonalization or derealization where they, they feel like you're not sure if different ways, um, different reasons people can use cutting. And it's, but it, it, it's not like if you cut, you have bipolar disorder. I think there's a mis, um, misperception that bipolar disorder is just this term for anything serious or weird or odd. Um, and I try and dispel that myth, rumor, um, misunderstanding uh, with all the videos that I do on bipolar disorder. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Question number 39. So just to keep an eye on the time here, I am at two hours and 37 minutes. Wow. I think I'm going to cut off at three hours because I think that's just reasonable for you guys or for anybody. I mean, maybe me and two of you can hang out, but, but my voice will run out too. I really wanted to get through more of these questions. So let me just keep going and see how far I can get. Um, so, okay, let me, there's a couple that I wanted to... All right, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping one from someone who asked two questions and I'm going to ask the second question. So anyway, this, this first one, this is not the person who asked two, but um, this is from Mary. Hi, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and have been in regular counseling in October of 2019 for the first time. At my request, my primary care doctor gave me 25 milligrams of Zoloft, but now I'm too scared to take it. Do you have any advice for someone starting an antidepressant for the first time? Ha, huh, well, it's pretty normal to be skittish about taking a medication, especially one that you know affects your mind and how you think that can be kind of frightening for people of like, well, how's this gonna affect me? Am I just gonna freak out when I take this medicine? And for some people, that's less of an issue because they're already freaking out. So they're like, I'll take whatever. I'll put whatever in my mouth if this is going to make me feel better. Um, 
you have anxiety. So that's, so, um, if, I guess to answer this would be a little more helpful for me to know what you're afraid of. Are you afraid of side effects? Are you afraid that it's going to change your personality? Are you afraid that it's going to, um, that you're going to be stuck? It's going to, you're going to get addicted. That's a classic one that I've seen that people, fears people will have that they'll get addicted to the medicine. So antidepressants do not cause addiction as we define it as having a physical tolerance and a psychological dependence on it. You're not psychological. So you might say, well, but I am psychologically dependent if I took it for anxiety and it helped my anxiety. I would say the comparison would be to taking an, an antihypertensive for your blood pressure, your blood pressure goes to normal. If you don't take the pill, your blood pressure goes back up. Are you dependent on the medicine? Well, okay, maybe technically you are because you because the medicine is treatment and that's what you needed to treat your blood pressure. Similarly, this medicine is to treat your anxiety symptoms. And if it makes your anxiety symptoms go away, it doesn't mean you're dependent on it. It just means it did what it was supposed to do. When you stop taking the medicine, your anxiety may come back or it might not because I, anxiety can just kind of come and go in waves. Sometimes you can go through a period where it's unmanageable and then you can go through a period where it is manageable. And this is kind of an important point I want to make that um, reaching for my waters. That I do think it's you should have reasonable expectations of what the medicine should do for you. So someone with anxiety, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that the medicine will make you anxiety free. Why? Because anxiety is still a response that we can have to a perceived threat. Your body is going to experience anxiety at some level for, for various reasons. The issue with it being a disorder is that it's persistent and it's unmanageable and causes problems for you. So if I'm driving in traffic and I see, um, you know, and I'm in, and it's jam packed and all of a sudden someone stops really quickly and I've got to slam on my brakes, my heart's going to be racing. That's a normal, natural response that should happen. I might still be out of sorts, like for the rest of the 15, 20 minutes it takes me to get home. I still might walk in the door and just feel like, and still feel like, still feel worked up about it, but I'll eventually settle down. Take that same kind of feeling. And for the person with say generalized anxiety disorder, um, they may feel like that without that trigger of needing to stop in traffic or avoid an accident. That's just how you can just feel with no real trigger. You can wake up in the morning and have that same feeling. But so um, what would I expect me with medication is that the medication will help you not feel so amped up and so uncomfortable, but you still may have a bit of a edge to you, like, you know, not just totally chilled, but still just kind of feel like, okay, I've got this to do. I've got that. I've got that. And, uh, you know, and feel a little stressed, we'll call it about your, your life. But wow. Thank you so much NZ for the $9 super chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so all I'm saying is that it is reasonable. It, it, it is, you should have reasonable expectations that the medicine should bring down your anxiety to a manageable level. You still may have some ups and downs. If you're told you've got a deadline, you're still going to feel some anxiety. That doesn't necessarily mean your medicine isn't working. You're just having that natural response. But what it should do is should help the unmanageable symptoms, whatever those look like for you. Um, you didn't ask this, but how long should you stay on it? Um, I usually tell people that we kind of treat it similarly to depression. Depression, we usually treat for nine months to a year because that's usually the natural course of the illness. For this, I usually do about the same. So don't expect to be on this like a couple weeks feel better and then okay. 
because chances are you're not kind of, you're not out of that anxiety period. So I will treat someone for a year, recommend they stay on it for a year. And then let's see what your life is like at, at that point. You might be at a phase of life where things are kind of on autopilot. You're not really making a lot of changes and things. And then you just kind of pull back off of it and see how you feel. And usually for someone who doesn't need to go back on it, they'll still feel a little more reactive uh, to things, but it's still not to the point where they're losing sleep, having panic attacks, um, things like that. Those would be the indicators that probably wasn't a good idea to get off the medicine. Let me get back on and we'll try another time. So those are the things that I kind of, the education that I give people when I'm starting a medicine, trying to address um fears that they have about starting it. Yes, there are side effects that you could legitimately experience and your doctor should have um, talked to you about those. Generally, it's anything gastrointestinal related. So dry mouth, like mine is today, but that's from me talking too long, talking a lot. Um, nausea, queasiness, diarrhea, constipation, usually the constipation and diarrhea or um, gastrointestinal, well, I said anything gastrointestinal, usually the bowel related stuff is short lived. So if you can just kind of get through it for a few days or so, some people it lasts longer than that. And that's a deal breaker for them. Um, all right, I hope I answered. Oh, but one more thing. So the antidepressants, though, in general, are pretty, you know, you, you can have those gastrointestinal side effects, but they're generally well tolerated. A lot of people take them for a lot of different reasons other than mental. So um, GI doctors, gastrointestinal doctors will sometimes use them for irritable bowel syndrome. Sometimes they're used in certain pain syndromes, um, headache management, fibromyalgia. One of the treatments for that is Cymbalta, um, which is a serotonin norepinephrine drug. So they're used by a lot of, they're, they're taken by a lot of people. So just, they're, they're not, they're, the antidepressants are not what I would consider like our big guns. Our big guns in psychiatry would be the antipsychotic medications that we use for mood stabilization and to treat psychosis. All right, Adnan, 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 can someone be just a little bit bipolar and not take medication? Or is bipolar disorder something that you either have at a strong intensity or you don't have at all? Adnan, <clears throat> you can't be a little bit bipolar, just like you can't be a little bit pregnant. There's either a baby in there or there's not. And so you can't, so you either have the illness or you don't, but you can be without symptoms for a long time. So as far as being a little bit bipolar, that can look like having manageable symptoms or no symptoms. I mean, some people do achieve remission is what we call it when you're without symptoms and you return to your baseline. So if we go back to bipolar disorder being depression and mania episodes. A person can have depression, recover, and have nothing going on, like be their usual self. And that can last a long time. If that lasts a long time, it only stands to reason that you might think in your head, well, maybe do I really have this? Is it gone? And it's probably not gone, but it could be gone for a while, like not permanently gone, but it could be gone for a while. And one thing I forgot to mention, earlier on the management of bipolar disorder and trying to keep it away, social rhythm therapy is something that is a great intervention for managing bipolar disorder symptoms, particularly if you are someone who's not on medication because you're feeling good and it's been a while since you've had an episode. That's not what I recommend, but there are people who stop taking their medications. Um, social rhythm therapy involves um, establishing a routine. Routine is super important for people with bipolar disorder, maintaining a routine. And likewise, I think it could fit into a self-care issue as well. Going back to a question, a question that I believe Ebony and Ivory answered, asked. So establishing a routine, I usually, there's several points. So social rhythm therapy, there's this whole like 
scheme or not, that's not the right word, but this whole um, set of things that you can make sure that you do the same every day. And it's like this long list of them. I usually tell people more of abbreviated form of it could be to make sure to set certain points in the day that are, that don't change the time you get up, um, the time that you get started doing stuff, whether it be going to work or getting your day started with um, activities that you do in your home. Um, and then one of your meal times, it could either be lunch or dinner, have that be the same around the same time each day. And then the time you go to bed. So if you have these like, beginning of the day and end of the day end point, And then another one in between end point, that could be probably dinner. Um, then you can try and fill in the other points uh, with other things that you do on a regular basis and keep those the same, but it's about keeping things the same. I've seen people in, in the comments section, you guys in the comments talk about how the routine really helped you. So it, it does really work and it does help. And that's what I would recommend to keep this. If you're going Adnan, if you're going through a period of doing well right now, I would still suggest adding that in because then that can just help you stay well. And like um, it has, excuse me, it has been shown to help prevent or delay recurrences of your illness. So it, you know, it, it, it's something real. All right. How are we doing on time? 10 more minutes. All right. Number 43. Maxime, how can you differentiate ADHD and adulthood and codependency? Okay. So I think I know what you mean by this, Maxime. What, what I usually think of as codependency, it's like this kind of catch term that triggers a certain thought in my head of addiction. And, um, but really codependency is, um, here, let me read the definition. Um, this is a definition. Codependency is a behavioral condition in a relationship where one person enables another person's addiction, poor mental health, immaturity, irresponsibility, or underachievement. So, so it has more to do with an addiction, but that's kind of how I think of it used a lot more. But codependency has to do with the other person. So it's a dyad. It's the person with the issue, whatever it is, their, whatever illness or irresponsibility or something. And then there's the other person. So the codependent person is the other person who's doing things to foster or, or enable or allow this other person's behavior. So on your question of how do I tell the differentiate between ADHD, adult ADHD and codependency, they're two different things. But what I think you might be asking about is how do you know if someone's being how do I know? Well, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. How do I know if I'm being codependent in someone who's got ADHD or if I'm just, I don't know, actually. Okay. So I do think it's easy. I, I don't know exactly what you're asking, but I do think it's easy to foster or perpetuate. Okay. Here's what I, maybe what you're asking how do you know if, let's say you're, you're a parent with an adult child, an adult meaning like 40, and your 40-year-old child has, has not kept a job living with you, you're supporting them. How do I tell the difference between, am I being, me being codependent and allowing this behavior to happen and that's the reason he hasn't launched or is it that he has ADHD and that he hasn't launched and I've just been back here trying to give a soft landing for him when he fails? Um, I will say that, so, you know, I do think that often adults, one way adult ADHD can look is fail, failure to launch, failure to be able to just kind of get on your feet and, and do well for yourself. 
Um, and a lot of it has to do with the executive dysfunction that, that the person with ADHD can have. It's a big problem when it comes to following through, planning, anticipating negative outcomes, things like that. And I have a video coming up on that. Um, I don't think you can just automatically assume that if you, in this scenario, if you have a child who can't keep a job, that he must have ADHD. Uh, I think you have to appreciate that that's one possibility and that maybe he needs some professional help that way to, to be able to, to get it together and be more productive and um, have his own life. But you know what? Someone being depressed can also be in a chronically depressed, that is, can be in a similar situation. So I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there, guessing what, uh, trying to fill in the blanks a little bit on how to answer this question. Um, I hope that's helpful for you to give you um, some thoughts. Maybe I touched on something that is your situation that, that answers that. Okay, Fisherman, 1992. I have a question. If you have bipolar disorder and have difficulty concentrating, will stimulants like Ritalin help? It's taking, maybe. Taking stimulants, if you have bipolar disorder, can be tricky because it can ramp up your mania and make it worse. It can make you rapid cycle, go from depression, uh, go from episode to episode. So, um, but it doesn't have to. So I think that um, I did touch on this a little bit in a previous question. You can rewind if you missed part of that when I post the replay. But, um, and I am gonna have these questions indexed by the way, or I keep saying indexed, but timestamped. Um, so I would be careful, or I would have, I would be careful with your doctor um, prescribing a stimulant for you. Um, it may be that getting your mania or depression under better control may help your thinking. However, people can have both ADHD and bipolar disorder or depression and have the treatment for the mood disorder not really help the ADHD. And the only way that really gets helped is with a stimulant. Keep in mind, Stratera is another ADHD medication. It is one, it's not a stimulant, I'm losing my voice. It's not a stimulant. It works differently in the brain. It's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, and, um, it's it, it's something you have to take every day. It's not a medicine that you can just um, take when you need to focus. And so some people don't like it because they don't feel the effect similar to the stimulants. Could it interfere with your bipolar medicines? Maybe. So that would be something your doctor would need to look at. Okay. I think this will be my last question, number 45. Please explain, oh, I didn't want this to be my last one. Maybe it won't be. Okay, please explain in one video about narcissistic personality disorder. <clears throat> I left this in here because even though, oh, this is by Saksimita. I know I mispronounced your name. Um, because I've been asked quite a bit about, my, uh, about nar I'm stuck on bipolar disorder. I've got that in my mouth, can't get it out. I've been asked about doing a video on narcissistic personality disorder. And I've been covering a little bit by little bit the personality disorders. Uh, I have not yet done a narcissistic one and I will eventually just to be complete and not avoid it. But there is no shortage of videos on narcissistic personality disorder on YouTube. They're just, there's whole channels about it. So on the one hand, I kind of feel like, well, does the internet really need one more video from me? Also, aside from that, and I, I get that some people just may want my take on it. Well, that's the thing. What is my take? Um, I don't want to just make more of the same of talking about narcissistic stuff. Um, I, I almost would probably focus more, in, instead of the focus being on the person on the receiving end, I probably would want to focus more on the person with the disorder because even though um, the behavior that manifests can be 
very irritating and painful and cause a lot of disruption, there are a lot of narcissistic people who have a lot of pain. And um, so yes, they create pain, but they have a lot of pain as well. And and that's not to say that, you know, oh, whoa, is the narcissist. I mean, I'm not trying to necessarily raise my hand and say, I'm going to defend them unlike everybody else. I, I just want to, I just would want it to be different. And I haven't figured out in my head how to do that. It's easier for me to, to make a video starting out with a question, a more specific question, than talk about this disorder because there's so many different directions I could go in. So all that to say, I'm, I'm working on, I'm, I'm, I'm not work, like literally working on it, but in my head, I'm just trying to kind of figure out how I want to address it. All right, one more question, because that really wasn't a, that was a different kind of question. Um, okay, so last question is from Crazy Ready 9 I suffer from bipolar with mainly a constant depression with a high anxiety. Sometimes I'm able to function, mostly not. I've worked all my life in, profession, in a professional capacity, but can no longer work in my field. I've been on so many different meds, nothing seems to work. I've tried a lot of self-work, being grateful every day, self-care, it works, but it's fleeting. I'm early 60s, now broke, can't work, exhausted and feel like I'm nearing my end. I'm desperate to feel better. To give you an idea of where I'm at, my house is a sty, flies everywhere. I sort of care, but not enough to do anything about it. Of course, I can't cook anymore. Help. Boy, crazy ready. I'm really sorry you're in this state. Um, especially being at where you've been on or tried so many things. Um and that things not aren't seeming to work. Um, so, you know, if you were to come to me for an evaluation, I would like get into more in the weeds of what have you tried? How was it tried? Because sometimes people say, well, I've done everything. Nothing works. And they may not have tried everything. Um, it may be that things had side effects. And so that you couldn't tolerate it. Um, I mean, you know, there's things like ECT, there's, there's magnetic, or there's, um, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulate. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff. Now let's just assume you've done all that stuff and you can't afford your broke. So you can't afford to go get something like that anyway, if you haven't tried electroconvulsive therapy. I think I would say, um, I would go with the behavioral activation approach um, as far as trying to contain and improve your depression, it may not completely treat your depression. So a combination of the depression diet, the behavioral activation, one of the things you can do and put on your list is starting by cleaning your house. And I say that not as a you need to clean your house, but from a, that's like create, you can create small wins. You can I assume you would prefer to have your house be clean. So taking things that you can do to chip away at that can the, the net result of seeing a cleaner house, you can actually walk around. There's not bugs and stuff like that can give you the feeling of some success, even if it takes you a while to get through it and break it up in chunks. Don't just try and clean my house. Start with the dishes or start with the laundry or start with, Sweeping, I mean, start with something and, and do it in little bits. That can be uh, fall under the category of behavior activation in the sense if you schedule out, and I don't mean like I'm going to do it at 11. I mean, you could get that, that granular with it. But from the perspective of today's Monday, today I'm going to do this activity. And then on Tuesday, I'm going to work on... Um, I'm going to gather the laundry together and I'm going to do laundry, including washing and folding. Maybe it might be too much to put it away right away. Okay. So tomorrow I'm going to put it the laundry away and then maybe do one other small thing, you know, that kind of thing where you actually like do have these things set and you hold yourself accountable to complete them. I don't know why I'm, why am I looking over here? The lights here. 
that you hold yourself accountable to, to complete those things. Uh, also, one other thing I try suggest is tapping. Here I go with tapping again. Um, and I keep bringing that up because it's so easy to do and so practical. I've heard it for, about it for years. I've only recently been a fan of it. So I guess that's why it keeps coming out of my mouth. But it is something easy to do and you can tap for depression. And to do that, I would recommend that app. It is free and you can get some free ones on there. So you don't have to pay for the upgrade necessarily. Um, but tapping is something you can you can pick you can pick almost any uh, pain point, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. So it can be anxiety. It can be fearfulness. It can be negative thoughts about yourself. It can be um, depression even. It can be pain. Ideally, there are, and, and just to kind of qualify this, there are EFT practitioners, and this is what they do. The advantage to going to a practitioner is that they can help you come up with the script, come up with the things that you should focus on, help you see what maybe your real thing is that's bothering you. You might say that it's fear, but maybe it's really shame. Um, you say you're anxious, but maybe you're really feeling guilty. I mean, so a therapist could help you figure that out. And that's kind of where that's, that's where that's a better deal or you get more out of it that way. But since you're broke, you can start with the, um, I still think that the, the app could help you um, have a tool to do to work on treating your depression or helping your depression. Okay. <clears throat> I think my voice is gone. I really enjoyed this, guys. Wow, we went three hours. Uh, I really appreciate you all. Um, Brave Star, thank you, Lucretia, um, Darren, and the doctors in school tell you about different types of therapy, but insurance just calls it cognitive behavior therapy. How do you find the different therapies? Um, oh, here I'm answering questions. See, um, yeah, you know what? There are so many kinds of therapies out there. I agree with you that, you know, it just all kind of gets lumped into cognitive behavior therapy. Try going to Psychology Today website. Um, they, I think they have some education on the various kinds of therapies. You can also find therapists on there. They have a practitioner listing for therapists as well as um, psychiatrists on there where you could find someone in your area. And a lot of people are doing virtual therapy these days. That's what I'm doing, seeing people um, virtually. But um, but I seem to remember um, they also have a lot of articles. I know that they have a lot of articles on their site, but I think they may even have like um, links to various kinds of therapies that you could learn about. One thing about that, though, to be wary of is just because you identify a type of therapy, that might not be the appropriate therapy for you and your problem. So, and it can, kind of can go both ways. You can see a therapy and go, hmm, I'm interested in that. Let me see if there's some practitioners who do that. But that practitioner might say, well, you know what, that, that might not be the best thing for you, but here's this other thing that's very similar that I think that would treat your anxiety better or something like that. Okay, that's it. I am done. I will be... Um, I am I am a little disappointed that I did not get through my 75 out of 100 and something. I only got to 45. I know that's still a lot though, right? So I will decide, I will, I mean, I could do this again and um, address these other questions. I'd like to, since you guys took the time to ask these questions. Um, so the real issue is do I, oh, thank you for the $10 super chat. I wish you put your name. I can't. I can't see who who you are, and I don't want to click on anything and have it stop on me. Um, so the issue, as I wrap up here, for you, two hundred forty five people still here. Thank you for still hanging in there with me. Um, so just kind of a little logistics talk is whether or not. So I have um, at least thirty more questions on this that I made up. And as I mentioned, I had over a hundred. I just didn't even get them all, you know, probably like maybe even 120 or 30 or so. 
Um, some of them may be duplicates. And what I could do is if I decide to cover more, just um, eliminate ones that are duplicates. Because I notice here, I answered a lot of questions about my polar disorder, but you know, those are your questions. And that's just, you know, your questions are your questions. Everybody's question is important. So, okay, I'm rambling now. Where, where I'm going with this is to address the rest of these questions, I could either do this live like this again, or I could pre-record it and just pop it up that way. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't able, what, what's the advantage of live? You get to see me mess up. <laughs> I mean, if I pre-record it, I'll edit out stuff. Um, and I, I, I don't like that I can't, I mean, I wish I could interact more with you. I really do. Um, yeah, this is my first chat. Um, or is that who you're talking about? Anyway, see, see, I, I'm not good at the chat stuff, uh, but I do wish I could interact with you. In fact, I had even thought about doing a, um, I'm blanking because my mind's a little fried right now. Um, what's that thing? Um, Zoom. Doing a Zoom and just take the first, I don't know how, what's the maximum number of people you can do on Zoom, but taking the first, whatever it is, 100 people, I think 100 might be too much, 50, I don't know, but, and, and do it that way. Just go, I can, just so that I can see you, because I can't see you. I see, you know, but so let me know what you think in the comments about um, future videos of this sort. Uh, Wednesday will be my regular um, kind of video that's been pre-recorded, edited, you know, um, that kind of uh, more high production type of thing. Um, and I have those scheduled out through April 22nd after that. That's it. So I could do a, some more of these um, and place them in there. And then, I, you know, I'll go back to my covering one topic type of video again. But so anyway, just I don't want to ramble. Let, let me know what you think. I don't want to let you go. I want to sit here and talk to you. Uh, but let me know what you think about um, how to go forward. Should I do another live chat and then cover more questions like I did this time? Um, I do want to get to these and I could just pre-record it or not. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for coming. And um, I'm going to, I don't know what happens after this. I don't know if it automatically just uploads or if I get to play with it. I would like to be able to clean up the sound a little bit because I know my mouth is dry and I can't stand mouth sounds. If I can't do that, just don't listen with earbuds. I don't want you to get irritated. I mean, if that doesn't irritate you, then okay, good, but it bothers me. So, all right. Thank you again for coming. Um, thank you for your support. Thank you for all the people, all the super chats. Um, I really appreciate you and uh, so glad you came. Bye-bye. And stay well. Wash your hands. Bye-bye.